1970, after the Off-Broadway theater strike, there was a play, wretched, obscene little play here called Life in Bed, which, like Al Co Oak Alcutter and Hare, stretched the parameters of allowable free speech in America. In each case, I understood where my father was coming from as a blacklisted writer in this country. What defines what happens on the stage here, besides the fact that we're a commercial theater and we're a public accommodation, is that my own beliefs, my own outlook has nothing to do with what is said on this stage. That this is a temple of free speech, and especially on a night like this where you are able to ask questions of people that you might not agree with. This is where democracy lives, and this is where progress happens in that process of questioning and responding. And I hope that uh, tonight everyone, panelists and audience alike, come by having made some progress, if not coming to an answer at the end. And we are overjoyed to have you here and overjoyed to have our guests here. Thank you, everyone, and thank you very much for coming. Uh, may we have another round of applause for Lorcan Ottaway, who was under... who was under some pressure, maybe some would say a lot of pressure, to uh, uh, deny you the opportunity to hear what these people have to say tonight. And he stood up to that uh, valiantly, and we thank him very much for that, and we hope many, many more years of that same sort of staunch uh, defense uh, happens here in this hallowed place of free speech. Thank you very much. My name is... My name is Tom Kiley. I do a radio program. I've had two of these speakers on as guests. Uh, and we're going to ha hear from all four of them tonight. We live in extraordinary times right now, as everybody can tell. Yeah. Um, and it calls for other than ordinary views into what's going on, because the ordinary hasn't worked anymore. It's not working. And they don't take the ordinary path. And it rankles some people. And I'm sorry about that, but in, in times such as this, this is what we need to do. They all happen to be speaking uh, about these times from a, what, what, what I could call a Jewish milieu or a Jewish perspective, okay? Whatever that means, okay? And we're going to get into that hopefully tonight as well, because it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But at least there is that uh, cohesiveness coming from these speakers tonight. There are people here that try to shut Jewish speech down. When was the last time that happened? Okay? When was the last time that happened? Under dire economic circumstances uh, that we see our country in right now. So, in any case, uh, without further ado, tonight we have uh, Stanley Cohen. Stanley. Uh, well, and Professor uh, Norton Mizvinsky. Michael Lesher, and Gilad Atman. Four, four people who take the path less uh, trodden, and we're going to hear from them. Thank you very much. I've been lucky or not lucky enough to be the first person to speak tonight. Let me say this. Um, uh, I'm a trial attorney. I try cases. I've tried cases all over the world. Uh, I have been voted for of the last seven years by a fascist organization called the Offshoot of the Jewish Defense Organization as the number one self-hating Jew in the world. In fact, the first time I won it, Chomsky called me to congratulate me to say he hopes that I've replaced them now. Um, I had prepared a, a, a dialogue that I was going to talk about the insular left in America. and. The encounter that I had outside has just caused me to sort of change my mind uh, a bit. I, I was approached by someone who had to be perhaps 18, who stuck a sign in my face that said, no Jew haters in my neighborhood. Um, and after asking him if he had reached puberty yet, um, I reminded him that this was my fucking neighborhood for 35 years. I also reminded him that every other person out there right now I have represented in court, arrested, 
for activity in this neighborhood. Activity that had nothing to do with religion, that had nothing to do with race, but had everything to do with principle, integrity, and speech. And that's what this is about. You don't have to like what I have to say. You don't have to like what anyone else on this panel has to say. The reality of it is, when speech is suppressed, it's an incantation to violence. There is today a growing repression, obviously, worldwide. At one point, we conveniently were able to blame the right. Uh, I now blame self-professed some of the left, which believes that it has the authority, as the right did forever, to deign what is appropriate speech. What I can hear and say, what my children can hear and say, what your children can hear and say, to shut down the marketplace of ideas, to control the dialogue, to dictate appropriate responses to given situations. That's called fascism. It's called repression. I am old enough to remember as a very young child McCarthyism from the right where Jews were largely the focus, artists and communists. I am now young enough to have engaged in McCarthyism from the left. And I blame the left, and I understand that there is this cult of personality that has developed, and I'm going to address that briefly. The, the position of the insular politics of the left, and I don't think any examination, objective examination, of the deity that we've created around the left in this country and overseas can lead to any other reasonable conclusion. Although it won't be the first time I've been mistaken, once before I was. <laughs> now, to my, to my left is this dangerous individual. He is this person that controls millions. He caused the Holocaust. He's causing the Holocaust in Syria. He's calling the Holocaust in Gaza. He caused the Holocaust in Rwanda. This is him. This is what people would have you believe. Now, we don't agree on many things. Well, that's not fair to say. We agree on a lot of things, and we disagree on some. But one thing we both agree on, and I think all four of us agree on, is the fact that there is no arbiter of thought or speech in a free society. There is no one who dictates the appropriate measure of what we can consider way and balance in the marketplace of ideas. There is no greater signpost of this today than academia. Academia is under attack all over the world. Now, it's convenient to point to Turkey, and Turkey is an example. But it's no less convenient to talk about Berkeley. And I'm not just talking about a year ago where there were efforts to close down BDS activity and faculty didn't get it and what it's now brought them is Coulter and what it's now brought them are fascists and what's now brought them is the fact that whenever you decide to engage in legitimate time place and manner controls based upon content it is a slippery slope it is one that, depending upon who controls the White House in this country, who controls the state legislatures in this, in this country, who, who wears a crown overseas, gets the control. If you want to give that up, fine. I have no problem with those women and men outside carrying banners. That's their right. It's beautiful. What I had was a problem that I became involved with earlier this week that there was some discussion about an attempt to shut this down. There was an effort brought to raise economic punishment to the theater. There was a discussion about uh, potentially violence, about charging the theater, about holding hands to prevent people from coming in. Now these are people that, that believe that they are the repository of truth and wisdom. They have a particular view. I welcome them to march up and down, to carry placards up and down, to come and debate, to ask questions and answers, but that's it. I think what needs to be discussed here very briefly is when we put this panel together, we reached out to a series of quote-unquote 
name leftists and name Zionists and said, come share a panel. Debate. Let's have a discussion. You may think I'm an asshole. That's okay. I've debated people all over the world. I've debated the Israeli ambassador. I've debated David Fromm. I've debated people in the Middle East and in Africa. People welcome you, they don't. They agree, they disagree. The fact of the matter is the marketplace of ideas is the only vehicle by which every man, woman, and child in this world can make a decision about what is appropriate and what is not for themselves, their family, their future, their world. Today we get these banners and we get these anthems and we get these oaths and we get these dictates and we get these signs stuck in our face. This is right, this is wrong. This is wrong, this is right. Fordham University refuses to recognize Students for Justice in Palestine, a university. About five years ago when I was doing a Hezbollah case, I needed an expert on Hezbollah to testify. I could not find an academic in the United States that was willing to come forward in a courtroom because they feared reprisal. And that's what we are talking about. We feared witches and we hanged women. And that's where we have evolved in this day. You know, it's interesting. Two posters, two road signs in particular struck me markedly today when I was on my drive down here today. The first one, I was coming from the mountains in upstate New York where there's still, you know, jail Hillary and, 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 you know, Trump for president. I'm driving down Route 17 and there's this huge electric sign that's going on and off with the fucking picture of Trump. I mean, he's won. He's there. But who knows where this money is coming from? And there it is. He's our man. He's our, I, where are we at? Well, I was thinking about what I was going to say. I've driven up and down the FDR for, you know, 18 billion years. I know these streets. Again, I mean, the squatter movement, I represented. 13th Street, I represented. Black Bloc, I represented. Act Up, I represented. There isn't a, a, a movement in this neighborhood that I did not represent, some of which I disagreed with. But I didn't disagree with their obligation to be able to be free to express their opinion. But I'll tell you the most powerful sign that I saw coming in here today was at the, the FDR. I, I've passed these signs a million times. I, I just, for some reason, I, it, I, it didn't focus. And 50 yards from one another, it said Frederick Douglass Boulevard. And had I gotten off on Frederick Douglass Boulevard, I would have turned on to Malcolm X Boulevard. And if I had gone a little bit to the left or to the right, I would have found Martin Luther King Boulevard. And if I had gone further into the heights, I would have found a host of who's who, of Latino, the, 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 the Venceramos, Fighters, women and men of principle that have taken stands, that have challenged the status quo, that have refused to be intimidated by the mob, that have often paid for their paid with the ultimate sacrifice, their lives, their freedom, their liberty. What? For themselves? To get rich? To become the president? Or because they were people of principle that were committed to truth and integrity and to discussion? Now I'm going to shift over very briefly. I'm looking here. I am summing up to a jury. I don't have a client. Maybe you're my client today. I think I consider it uh, very positive. Um, the insular left of America today, and I got to tell you, I have been fighting the national socialist movement in Europe for years. It's fascist, plain and simple. It is ugly. What it's doing to refugees. What it's doing to Muslims what it's doing to dissidents, what it's doing to political activists, somehow it has floated across the ocean. And the National Socialist Movement is alive and well right now, here and now, in the United States. Some are Jews, some are Christians, some are Muslims, some are atheists, but we have to be careful. So what's happened to my dear left that I first recalled marching across the Brooklyn Bridge a thousand years ago 
during an anti-war demonstration and for the first time felt the burn of pepper gas in my eye and the taste of blood in my mouth. What's happened all these years? Well, I'm going to point some fingers. I think recently what's happened to the insular left is we got screwed by Barack Obama. People had this notion, here was this handsome, dynamic, charismatic, brilliant young man running for president of the United States. He came out of the beach, and unlike the Donald Trump, with no shirt on, and everyone went, oh my God, look at this man. And he sold us a bunch of bullshit. And he ended up sending more people to prison of color than any president in the United States. And he's the only two-term president in the history of this country that was at war every single day of eight years. Killing civilians, including Americans, extrajudicial assassinations. So all of a sudden, Obama goes off, and people are all fucked up because he's going to Wall Street to make $400,000, as if it's a surprise. And so now, there's all of a sudden Michael Moore, and Oprah, and Kumbaya, and candles, and weaving, and we shall overcome. All of a sudden, lots of people, self-professed leftists, say, boy, did we get fucked. We got sold a, a, a bill of goods. So what happens? Instead of taking a look at the disease and the cause for the disease, we find a new disease. We find slogans. We find rhetoric. We find the comfort of Bernie Sanders. Now, it's funny. When I got out of prison, for those of you who don't know, I spent 11 months in prison. There were a whole series of engagements set up for me to start speaking about the BDS movement and about resistance all over the United States young college students that wanted to hear the voice of Stanley Cohen. I don't know why, but what the hell. And as I became more vocal in my opposition to Bernie Sanders, who's someone who I've known for 20 years, I followed his voting record, I've seen what it is on Palestine, I've seen what it is on prison America, more and more and more I spoke out. Instead of feel the, the, the burn, I coined feel the bull. And invitation by invitation by invitation disappeared because I had the audacity to challenge the golden calf. Well, I can't help it, because even though I'm a secular Jew, and we may disagree over what that means, if it's even possible, um, in, 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 the, in the religion of my parents and my grandparents and my great-grandparents, I'm a direct descendant of Moses and Aaron. You know, so we're iconoclasts. We break things. We jump up and down and scream and yell, and I guess that's why I've become the number one self-hating Jew in the world, who has spent 25 years accusing Israel of genocide, of ethnic cleansing, of violating international law, day in, day out, through every means possible. So we had Bernie Sanders, we had this cult of personality. So what do we know about Bernie? Well, yesterday he was one of the 100 US senators that had the nerve to sign a letter that supports Israel in the United Nations. But he did say Palestinians have a right to be treated with dignity and respect. I suspect that's as they're buried or killed by drones. But now, Bernie's been replaced by Ellison. Now, Ellison is the next hero, the next saving grace, because A, he's African American, and B, he's black. So we cover two bases with one. The only problem is he considers BDS, quote, somewhat anti-Semitic. Our next golden calf is Gabbard from Hawaii who's breaking bread with Assad. She's clueless about the events in Syria right now, and whose history of raising money for Christians for Israel, whose history of supporting uh, a fascist movement in India speaks volumes about that next level of golden calf, the cult of personality. We have other cults of personality in the left in this country. I'm a supporter of JVP, Jewish Voice for Peace, to some degree. Um, where we disagree, where I have challenged them, and the main reason why I've not been asked to speak by in front of them, even though a lot of their younger members support me, is because JVP claims to support Palestinian self-determination and self-defense, but tries to dictate the nature of the resistance. As long as it's peaceful, as long as it's kumbaya, well, let's get some sit-in counters underway and we can do it. So the next area where the left has deigned to dictate is with JVP today. And yes, it's a powerful movement and an important voice. But when they begin to dictate the nature and extent of the resistance in Palestinian, 
in Palestine, the Palestinians, they've crossed the line. Where else? Okay. Linda Sansor is now the chosen one. From nowhere, someone has become anointed, very much the way Sean King of the Daily News has become anointed, as the next guardian angels, the next leaders, the next spokespeople for the resistance. We have this tendency in this country and in this world to attach ourselves to a cult of personality. Syria. I find it fascinating to see the discussion over events in Syria from the left who support Assad, who they know nothing about, never having been to Syria, but support Assad because, quote, his resistance, his battle, his fight is secular. Well, I, I guess the Islamic Revolutionary Guard and Hezbollah, um, you know, went to Patrice Lumumba University. It's not simple. It's a complicated matter. But you hear more and more, especially young left, Siding with Assad because, in their view, it's a battle of religion versus non-religion. Well, I've got news for you. It's a battle over colonialism. And that's a problem the left needs to deal with today. And sometimes that means you break bread with Muslims. Sometimes it means you break bread with Christians. Sometimes it means you break bread with Jews. Sometimes it means you break bread with anarchists. But it means building coalitions to fight colonialism. It's not this singular, insular view that we now have, in particular in this country. And then we come to, and if I'm getting close to the end, someone tell me to be quiet and I'll... I'll just turn you off. You'll just turn me off. Okay. <laughs> let, let me really commit the cardinal sin today. And those who may follow me in social media or have seen some of the pieces I've written lately have seen this coming. Um, Julia Assange hero to hundreds of millions, uh, a golden calf, a cult of personality. Increasingly, the last year, Assange and WikiLeaks has become partisan and identified with a particular person, a particular movement, a particular group. And when you raise the challenge, you get challenged because you're going after the gods and the goddesses. And this goes back to my point about the cult of personality, about the insular views of the left in this country. We have to build coalitions. No, I'm not going to build a coalition with the Al-Qaeda, with the militia movement, with National Socialism. I'm not going to build a coalition with them. But I am going to build or work on building a coalition where people feel free to express their opinions, to join in resistance, don't get intimidated by the mob, don't get shut down because the speech they want to make is unpopular. It's about where we are going in the future. And in order to step safely into the future, perhaps not safely, we have to get beyond this insular politic that has taken over in this country today and now and here. It's dangerous. It's dangerous whether it comes from the right. It's dangerous whether it comes from the left. We have to be able to identify allies, work with them, fight with them, build bridges. We have to walk away from this narrow view that there are particular leaders, particular golden calves that are our spokespeople, that get up there and utter the slogans, that have the look, that dance the dance, and then at the end of the day, let us all down. So in closing, I think it's important for us to maintain consistency. Um, you may hear, I'm sure you're going to hear questions or comments from people on this panel you're not going to agree with. I don't agree with. So what? The difference between those of us sitting here right now versus those outside is you're going to be able to draw your own conclusions about the questions, about the answers, and the statements. And the people on the outside that are trying to shut down the dialogue are locked in time and space and are locked in insular, naive politics. And with that, up the rebels. Let me shut up. Yeah, I guess that uh, I'm going to talk next 
Uh, first, I really want to thank Lorcan, who stood firm in this uh, battle that uh, was imposed on him and on all of us. Sorry. All right, I see what you mean. Um, and uh, I think that uh, the way he fought this battle, as far as I could see, was with a lot of dignity, with a lot of compassion, with a lot of kindness. And this is something that uh, I didn't see in America for many years. And I think that uh, it deserves our support. Now, I'm, I'm not used to uh, share panels because nobody wants to share panels with me. <laughs> and the meaning of it is that when I give a talk, I get two hours, sometimes four hours. Sometimes I take a, a workshop a day. And to them, I'm supposed to speak for 25 minutes, which is an impossible mission for me. So I'm going to try to do something that I've never done before. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not sure that I know how to do it. I'm going to try to read. <laughs> uh, and it's all right approved by uh, my mom, who we'll checked the English. <laughs> Did you run up by the group outside? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah okay. for sure. Uh, Weinberg agreed with the first Very paragraph. Good. All right, here it goes. Long time ago, people believed that the political is somehow an extension of the will. This is not the case anymore. We are now reduced into consumers, and the role of the politician is to sustain consumption by means of credit. This worked for a while until money ran out. At a certain stage, we realized that we were buying with money we didn't have. In fact, with money we never had. We are basically impoverished, while some oligarchs not far from here in Wall Street are tripling their assets, their capital, once a month. Something that I guess doesn't happen to most of you, except you there. No, no worries. Um, I'm sure that you noticed that at a certain stage, our financial centers became suffocated with all those glass towers. You have plenty of them in New York. We have plenty of them in London, in Frankfurt all over. They were glass, they were made out of glass, I believe, metaphorically maybe, to convey the image of transparency. But when you get closer to these buildings, you find out that it's not glass, it's a mirror. And when you try to peep in, all you see is yourself standing outside in the cold. The book that I'm going to talk about, my new book, it's not out yet, but you obviously can buy it. If you buy 1,000, you get one for free. <laughs> the book that I'm going to talk about today, Being in Time, is all about that. That sense of being left out. This is, for me, the post-political condition. How did it happen? How did it happen to us? How is it possible that it happened and the academia wasn't clever enough to see what was going on? How the politics, the political, managed to slip away so easily? I identify two tragic political elements. One is the tyranny of correctness. The people who picketed against me or us or this gathering today 
apparently know better. They know exactly what we shouldn't talk about, what we are entitled to talk about. And when you think about it, this is a very, very unique kind of privilege. And we will talk about political, political correctness soon. The other very dangerous school of thought is identity politics. When we were young, left was there to unite us. They used to, talk, to tell us, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a gay or a black or a Muslim, we are all together against the capital. But in the world in which we are living, this doesn't happen anymore. The left has taught us to talk as a, as a Jew, as a woman, as a transsexual, as a lesbian, as a black. This is quite astonishing. Instead of being united, we are now engaged in endless sectarian wars. The women are oppressed by the male chauvinist, the black are oppressed by the red uh, rednecks, the feminists or gays are uh, in a fight with the homophobes, the Jews are in fight with everyone. <laughs> we don't get anywhere. We are stuck. Instead of uniting the working people, the new left broke the working sector into a set of isolated identities. This is the progue universe of the as a world, as a world. And who sustained this entire uh, farce? People like George Soros? And his Open Society Institute? And when you think about it, he just spent a fraction of his money, of his billions, he's one of the richest people in the world, to sustain this entire progressive madness. How did the good old left manage to fall into this trap? How did it led a new divisive ideology that is biologically determined. You had a problem with National Socialism. Mm. I actually don't have a problem with National Socialism. The idea of nationalism is not that frightening for me. And the idea of socialism is definitely not frightening for me. The idea of people being socialist or thinking in equality in terms of border is not frightening for me. The problem that we have with National Socialism, or some National Socialism, is the tyrannical aspect. And in the case of Hitler, obviously racism. The one thing that we don't accept is that a person is abused by a system due to the fact that he was born black, a Jew, a gay, or whatever. What is so astonishing about the left is that the new left, I'm talking about the new left, I don't have a problem with the old left, with Stalin, with, with, with the good guys. <laughs> 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 the problem with the new, and by the way, you know, you have, you have all these thing, awful things about me that I'm an anti-Semite, and now you see I'm, I, I really hate everyone equally, so, so really don't, don't, don't worry about those issues. How did it happen to the left that it's, it managed to pick the most problematic, disgusting aspect of Hitler ideology? The biological determinism. We are now divided sectorially by gender, by skin, in the case of Jews, by the, the blood of your mother. Very strange. 
why the left fell into this trap? Everything, you, you probably noticed, I, I find two devastating factors. The left is in a state of institutional animosity towards working class and working people. Why? Because the working people vote for Trump, they vote for UKIP in England, they want Brexit, they vote for Le Pen. And when you tell the working, a working person, listen, tomorrow there is a revolution, 10 o'clock, everybody should be there. Tell me, I cannot do it, I have to go to work. <laughs> you see, this is the problem with working class people. They go to work. This is why they are called working class people. They don't have time for those. I'm shouting like it's. Why do I shout? <laughs> you know, it's the National Socialism. It's the it? National Socialism. <laughs> you know, I ask Lorcan. I ask. I ask. I ask Lorcan. You know, just for my talk. You know, if we can have a small balcony. You know. <laughs> you know, it's a theater. You know, I just like this balcony talking to the people. Hey! No. Anyway. Working class people don't buy into left nonsense. It's very simple. The flag is their symbolic identifier. None of the people who picketed here today are factory wor workers. They don't have time to kill a that small line. You know, they may come to the concert tonight. So this is first problem that we detect, the left could see a point in dividing the working people. Suddenly, the left found a new oppressed, the woman, the Jew, the black. It was much easier. And in the book, we go into details because every, each of these, of these identitarian groups are actually cosmopolitan. All right? So it was, in a, in a, in, to a certain extent, a tribal Bolshevik project. The second factor that led us to, towards identitarian politics is Jewish intelligentsia. Why Jewish intelligentsia? Because Jews had problems in the past with the working people. Look what happened to them in Germany. Suddenly, the entire country wasn't happy with their Jews. And then Hitler started to expand, and this was the case in many other countries. In East Europe, in France, and so on and so on. So Jewish intelligentsia also benefits, see a benefit, in dividing society into sectors. Society had to be changed. The workers had to be broken. Their values had to be wiped out. How do we do it? You can buy the book and it teaches you how to do it. It's very simple. <laughs> but I'm going to present, uh, these are problematic terms, but I'll try to define them so you don't have problem with them. <laughs> Traditional Marxism is the belief that social and political change can be pushed through material shift, the revolution, changing of a, a labor structure, and so on and so on. Cultural Marxism, on the contrary, is the belief that social change can only be introduced through a cultural revolution. But let's make it juicy. American people don't really know how exactly the universe was tran transformed into the current progressive dystopia. How, how did they do it? How, how did it happen to you that suddenly, out of the blue, you were surrounded by all those kind of identitarian groups and you cannot get any act together? When exactly imbeciles, sorry, this is not nice. <laughs> when exactly 
a Jewish ethnic activist like Bill Weinberg, who tried to stop us today, became the, the, a master of correctness. When did it happen that a person like him, with zero record in anything, has managed to be, managed to appoint himself into the guy who decides who is allowed to talk about what? How is it possible that you don't know how it happened? You are intellectually castrated. And this is tragic. Why? Because of political correctness. What is political correctness? Political correctness is politics that doesn't allow political criticism or political opposition. Ladies and gentlemen, this is exactly the definition of tyranny. You say tyranny or tyranny in America? Tyranny. 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 You change because last depends on if you're in a black or Latin neighborhood. All right, sorry. <laughs> Ty tyranny, yeah? yeah. But let me tell you, political correctness is way more dangerous than tyranny because in the case of tyranny, you know that you don't like Tony Blair, Golda Meir, Stalin. Okay, I, I, I go, I, I go for it, yeah. But in the case of political correctness, it is a self-censorship. It is you who silence yourself. And the way it works, initially, you have a Trojan horse. Uh, Troy, Troy sorry, not Trojan horse. Trojan horse. Uh, this is not in the text. Uh, Trojan horse planted in your cognitive system. And it starts to blink and it blip and it's very painful when you think authentically. Oh, this woman, mm, she has been, you know, you know, and, and, and if you say it, you are punished. The next thing that happens, you don't say it. And then you learn not to think about it. And eventually, you learn, you teach yourself how not to think in general. <laughs> which is exactly the state, the current state of American society, Western society in general. So when and how was America reduced into a dysfunctional tyranny of correctness? Archie Bunker. Archie Bunker is one answer. Archie, Archie Bunker was, according to some polls, the most entertaining TV, TV character of the 20th century. We all loved Archie. And by the way, you know Archie Bunker? Probably not, you are too young. But most of you know Archie Bunker, yeah? I like Edith. Huh? I like Edith. It's, it's okay. I, 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 you didn't have to tell me. I can, the minute you came in, I, I could see that you are an Edith type. No, but, but we will get into it. Because, because all of us, all of us, we all loved Archie Bunker. We all loved Archie Bunker and looked down, admitted his son, son-in-law, as a pathetic, boring moron. And look at us now. 20 years down the road, and we are all meted. This is astonishing. Archie was basically an early, early version of, uh, of uh, Donald Trump. I am sure that you can see it. He was a star... Genuine, authentic man with clear values. I mean, I'm not so sure about Trump in that case. Straightforward, definitely. And his mind was a bag of black, black holes or blind spots. Yet, as much as we loved Archie, we all became meted. Week after week, Archie would attack a different sector within the American society, the women, the gays, the black, he pushed people to identify with the symptoms. Archie was a symbol of a dying past. He was a veteran, American World War II veteran. Meathead was the prospect of the new future, the new America. America that was slightly more tolerant. There was something Endearing. Pathetic yet endearing in meted. Was there a program? Was there an agenda behind Archie Bunker and all in the family? Of course. Norman Lear, 
The man who invented Archie was a progressive Jew who believed that he knew how to make the world into a better place. Through humor, he trained us to adopt new sensitivities. Was Lear a conspirator? Was he a cultural Marxist? I don't think so. He was probably a nice man. I don't know, actually. I assume. <laughs> but the lesson is devastating. The cultural revolution that you went through was taking place under your radar. While the CIA was struggling to infiltrate into American anti-war cells to find the commies, Leo was sitting in front of his typewriter and delivered the revolution to your TV screen at prime time, we were transformed into progressive while drinking beer, eating popcorn, and playing with our kids. Whether you like it or not, this is genius. Now, here this, there is an interesting anecdote. In 1970s, the Archie Bunkers, I assume that there were a few of them, were a continuum of blind, blind spots. They were detached from the transformation, uh, rea the transforming reality. They didn't hear the cry of the people of color, the gays, the women. We are talking about 1970s. In 2016, it was basically the method, the method, the Clintons, her backers in Wall Street, who were exactly the same. A bag of blind spots. It was them who didn't hear the cry of the American people, especially the blue collar workers who were reduced into a worker or workless class. Being in time, this book is a sequel of The Wandering Who. I assume that quite a few of you, I signed a few, and I know that quite a few of you have the book. It is an attempt to dissect the true meaning of Jewish power. Jewish power is that which we are not allowed to talk about. It is an attempt to explain the continuum between Marx, Rothschild, Adorno, Marcuse, Soros, the list of New York 100 worst landlords. Have you seen this list? <laughs> I saw it, somebody in New York, a friend, showed it to me yesterday. It looks like, like, like a guest list of a bar mitzvah. <laughs> I've never seen something as devastating. Israeli criminality, APAC, Bill Weinberg, and Norman Lear. We have to understand what is happening there. And it's fascinating. It's fascinating for me. I'm not talking about the Jews. I try to understand this culture. What is Jewish power? Jewish power is the power to silence criticism of Jewish power. Is it APAC? Is it Dershowitz? Is it Bibi Netanyahu? No. No. It is actually Democracy Now!, Real News, Mondo Wise, JVP, the Chomskys, that go out of their way in an attempt to divert the attention from the J system, from Jewish power. Where Mersheimer and Walt were invited by Amy Goodman to discuss the 2006 book on the Israeli lobby, Amy Goodman didn't invite them in. Instead of inviting them, Mersheimer or Walt or both of them, she invited Chomsky to criticize the book. <laughs> this is not how America should operate. This is not how leftists should operate. In The Wandering Who, the task was very, relatively easy. I looked into the metaphysics of those who identify politically as Jews. This is an easy job. People who identify politically as Jews have a problem. Politically, not religiously. And my, Michael Lesher will talk about, not relig about this distinction. Not religiously, not by ancestry. People who identify politically as Jews 
subscribe to a political school that is racially driven. So Ahmed from Gaza cannot be the head of JVP because he's not racially qualified. In fact, the Israeli parliament is more tolerant than JVP, which is absurd. In Being in Time, in my new book, I broaden the scope, and I believe that I complete my journey. I may, not, I may not write about the J thing anymore. I look into the categorical dichotomy between Jerusalem and Athens. The split between Athens, the capital of reason and logos, and Jerusalem, the city of revelation. In Athens, we think things true. In Jerusalem, we obey mitzvot first. Being in time suggests that the West is ill because Jerusalem has been at its elm for too long. Now, it's very important for me to, to explain it to you. When I talk about Jerusalem, I don't talk about Jews. Hillary Clinton is a Jerusalemite. Theresa May is a Jerusalemite. Jesus wasn't. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking. Big in time suggests that the West is ill because Jerusalem has been at its elm for too long. It proves that progressive thought is a form of chosenism. If you are progressive, someone else must be reactionary. The progressive discourse is, in fact, the secularization or the continuation of the Goy Jew split. Progressive, reactionary, Jew, Goy. Being in time suggests that for the West to recover, and we can do it, it must first reinstate, reinstate Athens in its midst. That's all. Um, uh, how, do, how do you feel? How do you feel? Keep on going. Huh? Keep on going. Keep on going. Yeah, I, that's, what, that's what I thought. I have only one question I want to ask my brother. Yeah. You're not going to wait for questions to ask? No, no, no. I just, I just, I, I just, I'm, I'm trying to figure out when I was growing up in Westchester, surrounded by wasps that ran yeah. the country. Yeah. And when I was traveling down south, and came across those signs on lawns that said no niggers, Jews, or dogs, whether that was workers who put those signs on the lawns, or whether National Socialists before they were called National Socialists. This is, this is a good question. This is, do you want me to answer it now? No. Okay, okay. Later. <laughs> we will keep it. <laughs> Sorry. Mike. Yeah. Okay. The, the mic? I, oh. Ah, Mike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Oh, Mike. Mike. <laughs> In Palestine, they call it water, I think, you know. But. This, is, this is the ultimate symbol of American impoverishment. <laughs> I'm, I'm not, I'm you not. notice it's not made of shovels. <laughs> no. <laughs> that would make me feel very much at home. Uh, I'm, I'm, I think I'm the first Orthodox Jew speaking here tonight, so I should probably be the first to cite the Talmud. Um, which encourages everyone who speaks to a gathering to first thank the host. Um, so I, I think I should say a word uh, of thanks to, uh, to Theater 80, first of all, for having us here. I, it seems it was a little bit more of an, uh, of an accomplishment on their part than I would have thought. Uh, I didn't know it was that controversial. Um, anyway, uh, but I appreciate that. And also I should thank Gilad Atzmon for inviting me to speak. Um, especially because he, I don't know him, he really doesn't know me, I think he's read a few of my columns, the poor man has no idea what I'm going to do here. Um, and, and oh, I think he does. Neither do I, well, I don't, that's okay, that's really another story. Anyway, um, I should mention, so I, I describe my, I think I was called in some of the advanced literature about this a whistleblower, 
I'm not sure exactly how to take that, and especially in, in, a, in the company of a saxophonist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm supposed to blow a, play on a whistle and then he play. But we'll see. I don't know. I, I am not very good on the whistle. But I, what I am, I, I, I define, I describe myself first and foremost as a writer, uh, a poet. I've also written fiction and some nonfiction, including a very nice book called Sexual Abuse, Shanda, and Concealment in Orthodox Jewish Communities, of which I happen to have a copy here. If anybody's interested in buying it, you'll, be, you'll make me very happy. It's, I'm afraid the book is still something of a secret. Um, but I, I should also mention that besides that, I, I am a lawyer and I have done some legal work along civil rights lines. Uh, since I'm here, I think I, I would like to mention that one of the cases I've lost that I was particular, and I'd lose almost all of them, um, but uh, I was particularly proud of. I do mostly appellate work, and so it's mostly writing, although I got, uh, sometimes I get to argue the appeals also. But um, I did the legal papers for Amiri Baraka in his suit against um, uh, New Jersey officials for giving him the boot. Uh, from his position as New Jersey Poet Laureate because he wrote some things that they didn't like, or really more specifically the things that Israelis didn't like and therefore some of the local Jewish community didn't like. Um, I was very happy to write those briefs. We lost, but I think Stanley will appreciate this. We got a strong dissent from the Third Circuit. Uh, so one judge agreed with me against the other two, and so my hope is one day when somebody is researching this legal issue uh, and comes across this idiotic decision and reads the dissent, she'll say to herself, why didn't they listen to that guy? He's so obviously right. <laughs> and of course, they won't be saying my name because I'm not mentioned there. In fact, I didn't put my names on the uh, on the briefs at that time for family reasons. But um, anyway, that's some indirect contribution that I hope I made somewhere. Anyway, I'm he not here to talk about that really. I'm here to talk because I'm also an, an Orthodox Jew. And the question was something about Jewish identity versus Jewish religion. Um, and I'm going to talk about it through the very narrow lens of what Jewish identity has co is coming to mean from the point of view of Jewish religion, that is traditional Judaism. Now, that may sound like a pretty narrow topic. In fact, if you're outside it, it may sound like an awfully simple topic, but as I'm going to try to suggest, it really isn't so simple. I'm also going to try to suggest maybe a reason or two why you might care, even if, you're, even if this seems rather remote to you, uh, apart from the reason you might care just because of the way you might care about uh, Kurdish nationalism or something else. So here's, uh, just to get into the issue, just I want to cite a couple of pieces of writing that came out in 2011 on the same subject from two different Orthodox Jews. Uh, and they're writing about the release of Gilad Shalit, who if you don't remember was an Israeli soldier who was taken captive by Hamas in, in Gaza. Uh, in 2006 and, 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 and was held for a number of years before the Israelis would agree to terms for his release. And um, so w when he was released, there was a, a column written by an Orthodox rabbi in one of the Orthodox magazines in what I can only call a very boastful language about the tremendous solidarity J between Jews, he said, was shown by the worldwide Jewish campaign, particularly among religious Jews, for this uh, uh, IDF soldier, Gilad Shalit. And he said, this, I'm quoting him now, this was an expression of the underlying unity of Am Yisrael, that is the people of Israel, the Akdus, which means unity, described by Torah commentators by the analogy, when one part is hurt, the whole body feels it. And he went on to claim that some Arab columnists, who they were, I really don't know, but he said, according to this rabbi, they expressed the wish that their fellow Arabs and Muslims should learn to value a single human life as the Jews do. Now, I, I, I know, I mean, there are a lot of things we can say about that. I'm going to come back to it. He's telling the story backward, first of all. You know. uh, I'm sorry, I'm not being heard? No, I'm Okay, well. I, do, I can, you can talk to me and I'll uh, shout. I'll do the best I can. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'm not, I'm not as good at shouting as I thought. Well, that's, that's okay. So I know but he's telling... You can come closer, yeah. really. That, I think there are some seats down <laughs> here if you want to do it. All right, so now I know he's telling the story backward. I know that... He, he, he's, you know, he's telling a story as if this IDF soldier were the, the victim and in, when in fact there were Israeli soldiers killing scores of civilians in Gaza during this time. There were thousands of Palestinian prisoners held in Israeli prisons at the same time and somehow it was only, and in fact, two civilians in Gaza had been kidnapped the day before Shalit was taken prisoner. Nobody ever talked about them. Nobody ever worried about their release. But that's not the point I want to emphasize. What I want to point out is the peculiarity of the fact that for this rabbi, every Jew under the sway of Jewish tradition was supposed to, and according to him, did identify 
with Gilad Shalit as one of us. Now that's significant because Gilad Shalit was by no, uh, on no account a religious person. He happened to be Israeli. The rabbi, by the way, is American. Gilad Shalit speaks Hebrew. I don't think he speaks English or doesn't speak it very well. I doubt this is rabbi speaks Hebrew. They don't share a religion in common. The only thing they shared was that they are Jews, and according to him, that was enough. He didn't mean this unification, this identification to be universal with all people. Obviously, he meant only Jews. But he meant this person to be included. Now, the second piece of writing was a response to that column, and it came from an ortho another Orthodox Jew who lived in uh, Great Britain, and he wrote this. Let's debunk the myth of Akdut, which means, again, unity, which Rabbi Grilak postulates. The Haredi community, that is the ultra-Orthodox community, didn't give a hoot about Gilad Shalit. This was sadly reflected in my own community of Manchester, UK. There have been several rallies and meetings in support of Shalit. Where were the Haredi? I think it goes on like that. And he says, no, no, they, they only rallied on behalf of other Orthodox Jews, but not these. Now notice, these two writers disagreed about what the Haredi community actually did. Did they identify with people who were not religious or didn't they? But they agreed on one thing, which is that they all should. They all should identify with this man, religious or not. That's the central point of both arguments, and yet, interestingly enough, neither writer explains why. Now, what makes that especially remarkable is that both of them must have known that the issue had come into question. It had come into question in writing because a rabbi not so long before Shalit's release, a, a rabbi associated with the Satmar Hasidic uh, sect, had said publicly that Jews should not be campaigning for him. Religious Jews should not. Why? Well, authority according to rabbinic law. And the Talmud basically defines the, the, the obligation of redeeming captives according to how you stand in certain religious terms. We don't really have to go into details for purposes here. The point is that it was a religious definition. idea is if he's not one of you one of this he's not one of us and we don't have a particular obligation as a, for him as a member of the community to rescue him as a captive both these writers obviously were rejecting that definition and neither says why and I think that's kind of important because if you don't have a religious definition as a religious person that defines Jewish identity then what does define it well I would also like to say that this is not as simple a matter as one might think it is, just looking at it objectively, because I distinctly remember that day in November of 1995 when the Prime Minister of Israel was assassinated by a religious Jew. I don't know how things were where you are, but in my community, I was very struck by the fact that almost everything I saw was business as usual. Nobody took, everybody took it totally in stride. Nobody was surprised by it. Now, I have to say, I think since 1995, in those 20 odd years, I've grown some and changed some politically. Uh, I like to think for the better. But even in 1995, Yitzhak Rabin, the, the officer in charge of the death march, was not a hero of mine. But when you're a religious Jew, and a religious Jew has just assassinated a head of state, and he did it ostensibly for a religious reason, and the religious reason he stated quite openly was that, that Rabin was going to do something right. He was going to comply with international law and end the occupation of Palestine. Not that that's what was going to happen, but that's obviously what he thought, and that's why he did it. I would think if you're a religious Jew, that's a, a reason for some sober reflection. I was wrong. And when I asked a couple of people about it point blank, they said Rabin was not one of us. So now, what's the difference between Yitzhak Rabin, general in the IDF, and Israeli, Hebrew speaking, and Gilad Shalit, corporal or sergeant, I've seen him described as both, maybe they promoted him, but a, 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 another soldier in the IDF, Hebrew, uh, Hebrew speaking, Israeli, non-religious, except ideology. Well, yeah, there was an ideological difference, presumably, but again, if ideology disqualifies you from being one of us, then how come religion doesn't? <laughs> So where are we with that? Um, and and, and uh, just one more example, I, if, if I have time, I think I have time to go on with this. Does anybody here remember mm -hmm. Eric Brindell? I don't know if that the name is familiar. Yeah. You do? Yeah. Okay, then I will tell the story. Eric Brindell, I don't think he's living anymore, but he, he, he was at one time writing op-eds in the New York Post. He's an, he was an Orthodox Jew. I, I think, in fact, at one time he was in charge of their editorial page. 
And, and the issue came up while he was writing these things that a, a Jewish woman named Lori Berenson was arrested in, in Peru uh, uh, under a dictatorship backed by the United States and was accused in a rather obscure, with, uh, on the basis of obscure evidence, was supporting a guerrilla movement, which they considered a terrorist movement. Anyway, she was tried in kangaroo court. And her family, trying to rally support for her, among other things, turned to the Jewish community. And the reason I'm bringing this up is that Eric Brindell wrote an op-ed. I can't find it online today, but I remember it very vividly, in which he said, this is silly. Just because she's Jewish, don't come to the Jewish community with this. She's not one of us. So again, she wasn't one of us, according to this religious Jew. Israel was. He was very happy to support Israel. So Israelis, yes, whether they're religious or not, even though the state of Israel is officially not a religious entity, was founded on, a, on an ideology which uh, actually rejected traditional religion, that's okay. But the leftist, as he called her, the leftist, Lori Berenson, was not. So uh, Jewish tribal solidarity is good for Israel, bad for Lori Berenson. Does everybody understand? <laughs> okay, now see, I'm getting some laughs. See, the, the, the pro part of the problem is, is that we usually don't even think about it. And this is what I'm trying to suggest, that, that this is a question that really should be thought about. Uh, in fact, I remember when, when the issue was such a hot one in Israel, uh, that because they were debating the details of what was called the law of return. Unfortunately, Israel has this racist law that, that favors Jewish would-be immigrants to Israel over all other would-be immigrants. But the question is, if you're going to favor Jews, you have to have a definition of Jews. So, oh, I remember, this was a stormy debate, at the end of which they came up with the old Talmudic definition, which says, well, you're Jewish if you're the child of a Jewish mother or converted by an Orthodox rabbi. And you think about that, that definition doesn't make a whole lot of sense in the, in the modern context. First of all, because it conflates two different things. You talk, on the one hand, you have a genealogical definition. You're the ch child of a Jewish mother. It makes no difference what your religion is. But if you're not the child of a Jewish mother, then religion means everything. You've got to be converted not just according by a rabbi, but by an Orthodox rabbi. And it especially makes no sense in the context of the state of Israel, where the majority of people are not Orthodox. But that's what they did. Why? Well, I would suggest largely because that's the only definition we've got. Nobody has ever really worked out a definition and achieved the acceptance for that definition that would be necessary to replace that old one. And so we ended up falling back on that. This is the kind of problem that we have now. We haven't always had it, but now that we're getting there, I think we, 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 we need to talk about what it means and how religious people within the Jewish community are going to define being Jews. And as I'm, I'm going to borrow a text from Gilad Atzmon himself now. I think he's mentioned it already, but he, he, he and I communicated about this briefly in some emails. And he said there are three, and it's a good text, he said there are basically three kinds of Jewish identity. There is identification with Torah and mitzvot, which means the commandments, so that's a religious identification. You can identify with Jewish ancestry, just the same as somebody would say, well, I'm of Irish ancestry, I'm of Turkish ancestry. And the third is a political identification. Now, you might think that if you're a traditional religious Jew, if you're somebody who comes from the community that I live in, the answer to that question, the, the, the choice of the one of those three would be obvious. It would be number one. But guess what? It's not. And, and, and what, one of the things that we're observing today, as the examples I've been mentioning are, are, are intended to suggest, is that the definition of being a Jew from within the religious community is shifting from the first of those three to something more like the third or a combination of one and three. And I also want to suggest that that combination can be very, very dangerous as well as incoherent. Again, let me give you a couple of examples. I, I find this kind of interesting. This is a theological example. Uh, I, I, I saw it recently from, from an Orthodox rabbi named Blech. I think the first name is Benjamin. I'm not positive. I just saw it uh, in, in the text I saw. They gave, they gave the last name, Blech, Rabbi Blech. Now, he, in this piece of writing... On 79th Street. He's Orthodox rabbi. Okay, yeah, yeah, I think on that's On 79th Street. Okay. So uh, he, he, um, he, he wrote this. I mean, I, 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 you know, I'm not, not slandering the poor man. He wrote this down. He, he said that he, he was troubled by the fact that the seventh day of Passover which in the biblical text is designated a holiday, right? It has the same kinds of holiday characteristics the first day. And everybody knows what we do on the first day of Passover, right? That's when you have the Seder and all that stuff. But the seventh day is also hallowed in that respect. But he was bothered by the fact that there's, nothing, there's no resonance between that holiday and anything else that happens in Jewish history. And then he said, yeah, but guess what? 
I, I have to read this because I can't keep it in my head. It, it turns out whatever day of the week turns out to be on the seventh day of Passover in a given year, whether it's Monday, Tuesday, and so on, that will also be the day on which the anniversary of Israel's founding occurs, the fifth day of the month of Yar. A miracle, see? Now, I, I have, yeah, okay, right, so, so some people laugh, okay, but, 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 but let, me, let, me, let me just, you know, uh, it, it, it's somewhat funny, but to me it's also a little disturbing, because for a religious person, it really takes nerve. I mean, apart from the oddity of the argument, it takes some nerve to drag the founding of a contemporary secular state right up to the level of biblical text. <laughs> and it's dangerous. You know, you probably are familiar with the warning that Augustine made about reading uh, scientific claims into scripture. Uh, you, it's, it's, it's become famous because not only did he write it, but Galileo then quoted it very famously. Uh, and, and Augustine's warning was, if you read a scientific claim into scriptural text, you run the risk that in time, that claim is going to run afoul of, 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 of later discoveries or theories, and th then you're going to look bad. You're going to have a problem with people saying, oh, the scripture isn't true, because what you read into it turns out not to be accurate. It's actually a pretty smart observation for somebody in the fifth century to be making. And he's got a point. And the same thing is true of history. I mean, e even if you could you know, buy his, his vision of the state of Israel, which I, which I don't, um, who could say what people are going to think about this in 10 years, in 50 years, in 100 years? That's something that people are supposed to think about religiously, and it's amazing to me that it just sort of slipped, slipped the rails of this rabbi's mind. And he's not an exception. Decades ago, uh, there was a very popular book written by a rabbi named Eliyahu Kitov. Um, uh, it, it was written originally in Hebrew, but there's also an English translation of it called The Book of Our Heritage, which is very popular. It's on the shelves of lots of religious Jews. Uh, most of it is just about the background and customs of the various Jewish holidays. I have no problem with that. But then he comes around to Israel's Jerusalem Day, which commemorates the seizure of East Jerusalem by the IDF in 1967. Uh, plenty of Palestinian civilians were killed, and there were houses destroyed, and ethnic cleansing of the area. That he doesn't mention. But this he does say, and this is, this is the sort of passage that just, every time I look at it, just, just makes me, uh, well, uh, listen. Two days before the start of the war, there had stood surrounding the borders of Israel all the armies of Egypt, Jordan, Syria, and Iraq, which then had nearly 200,000 troops supplied by Russia with an arsenal of mighty weapons. In the ears of the whole world, they arrogantly declared, we are set upon destroying the Jewish state and murdering its inhabitants. You can't miss the biblical resonance and tone of that kind of passage. The only problem with it is every single statement, and it is absolutely factually false. <laughs> now, we know that to be true now. He may not have known it when he wrote it, but there you are. You're taking a very big chance when you take a piece of contemporary history that you only know about because of what's in the headlines of the newspapers and what government propaganda is telling you, and hope, hope that in 50 years time, see I'm reading it about 50 years later, right? 50, you hope in 50 years time it's still gonna sound good. Well, it isn't. And when religious Jews can start to think that way, when they can start conflating secular contemporary uh, actions of a so-called Jewish state with what the Bible says, um, you're taking a very big chance with your religion, and that's not something that a rabbi is supposed to do lightly. Now, uh, my, my own opinion, which I, I think you can intuit more or less from what I've said, not that anybody really has to care about my opinion, but I'll just mention it, is that once you deviate from a religious notion of Ju Judaism and Jewishness, you are asking for big trouble, and, and we've got to that big trouble. Um, and, I, and I just briefly want to mention before I go on into other things, because I do want to say that it's, that it's not enough. I, I, it, it, it seems from Gilad's um, the division of these three uh, uh, types of identity that if you stick with the first one, you're on safe ground. I'm not so sure. But first, let me just mention why you might care, even if you're not a religious Jew, even if issues of Jewish identity mean nothing to you, and that's entirely possible. It's certainly you're right. But the obvious first reason it would matter is Israel. Because as we can see, as religious Jews more and more identify Jewish identity with a secular state and what it does, even though the secular state was founded on principles quite different from, and in some respects, inimical to Jewish tradition, unfortunately, the worst, in, the worst aspects of the two tend to reinforce each other. Um, I would argue that 
uh, today's Orthodox Jews, when they identify with Israel, are not so much identify, I mean, there are some who identify with it religiously. There's the settler movement, which I, I, I don't know. I, it, it's hard to describe it except in terms of psychosis, but <laughs> at least for me. But, but there are also just mainstream Orthodox Jews who feel a lot of identification with Israel, I think, unfortunately, because some of the chauvinistic strains in Jewish tradition match up to all too well with the chauvinistic strains in Israeli propaganda, not to mention the sense of victimization, which both te groups tend to play on. Uh, Israel you know, throwing up the specter of the Holocaust at every opportunity. Uh, Orthodox Jews, again, and, and not, 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 not entirely wrongly, but you know, looking back to their own history and, and the unspeakable savagery that has been uh, used against Jews and saying, well, we see again a reflection of this. So when the two join forces, you get some of the most fanatical support for Israeli militarism and uh, and and um, uh, uh, and the and the oppression of Palestine from religious people. That's one reason to care. Another reason you might want to think about it is that the way Jews, religious Jews, identify in this country can have a very practical effect on you. And let me just give you one instance, which I again wrote about in this book, which uh, a very very nice, attractive book, which you can buy on online. Um, <laughs> A few years ago, actually 2009, a uh, rabbi named Israel Weingarten went on trial in federal court. He was eventually convicted of raping his daughter uh, over a period of many years. He got a 30-year prison sentence. She, had, she started when she was 10 years old. Uh, he had done it for many years. Uh, they were able to bring it in federal court because he took her, he took her in and out of the country. Um, so he went to prison. That got a lot of press in the tabloids. But there were things that you didn't see covered in that story in any New York newspaper, which I think really deserve reporting. As far as I know, I'm the first person to write about it. You didn't know that the story of, Ry of Rabbi Weingarten's abuse actually surfaced seven years before the federal prosecution in the state system. And nobody in the state, Rockland County, because he was a resident of Kirishol, which is located in Rockland County, ever touched that case. Uh, for seven years, child welfare officials never interfered with what was going on in that family. In fact, when the, when, the, when the charge first surfaced, which was in divorce proceedings, guess who got sole custody of all the minor children? It was the rapist. And so he, and, uh, and the ex-wife was maligned by the community, and the, it, originally it was a rabbinic panel that awarded custody to him because the couple had gone to rabbis uh, in keeping with the custom of their community to get a divorce settlement, but it was then rubber stamped by a Rockland County family court judge. You didn't know that. And I think you probably should have, because cases like this that occur in other countries and are, and are the work of other religious groups do get written about. The New York Times had a very prominent story on a mullah in Afghanistan just around this time who um, got sentenced to, uh, I think it was 10 years or uh, 10 or 20 years, I can't remember now. Uh, again, for raping a 10-year-old girl. Good story. I'm glad they reported it. It was important. And all the things I've just talked about in that, in, in the Weingarten case, which were really present in the uh, Afghanistan case as well, except for the extraordinary influence the Orthodox Jews in Rockland County had on the legal system, all that was properly reported. But it didn't get reported here. And I think there's something, that, there's something to be said about a situation in which you can have, what do we have now? I think over 20 states in this country have anti-Sharia laws, a as though Muslim law is somehow a dire threat to American democracy. But you don't have anybody talking about what we might do to worry about rabbinic influence or Orthodox Jewish influence in places like Rockland County, in places like Brooklyn, where I know of cases that were derailed by, in, the, in the secular justice system because Orthodox Jews identifying with the perpetrator instead of the victim, decided to pressure the system into doing it. Now, I'm not saying this is the whole story. I'm not saying this is the only thing wrong with our system by any means. Believe me, I know that. I'm not saying these are the only people doing it. But you ought to know about this. And when I raised the subject, um, I, uh, I got a lot of criticism. I got a lot of criticism from within the community, and I, I don't hear a lot of other sources backing up the, an investigation into this kind of thing. You will be accused of anti-Semitism. You will be accused of being a self-hating Jew. In fact, curiously enough, I was described in one of the Orthodox magazines as a longtime agitator against the Orthodox Jewish community. The reason being that I've done this work on behalf of Orthodox Jewish people who are victims of child abuse. So obviously that's agitating against the community. 
when you have people defining their identity like that, it affects you too. Because this is your system that's being affected. This is your court system, your justice system, your child welfare system. And all of us have to care about what happens there. Now, let me go back just a little bit. You know, if we say that transforming a religious identity into a political one is dangerous, and I agree with Gilad there that it is, I'm not so sure that sticking entirely to the traditional religious Jewish definition is, all in, is entirely innocent either. And let me explain what I mean. And again, I am an Orthodox Jew. I chose Orthodoxy as an adult. I didn't grow up in it. There's a lot about this religious tradition that I believe in. There's a lot that I love. But there are also strains in it. And this is not surprising. It would be true of anything as old as Judaism is. But there are strains in it of chauvinism. There are strains in it that could only be called racism, especially directed at non-Jews. There is a kind of bitterness that one finds in some Talmudic and post-Talmudic texts that was driven largely by, by persecution of Jews, but is still there. Now, let's go back, for example, and this is how I, I what I, makes me worry about it is the kind of contemporary effects this kind of thinking can have. I can understand it on the part of somebody who lives in a ghetto, who, uh, you know, who, whose only experience with non-Jews is, is getting beaten over the head or being threatened with, 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 with death or being called a Christ killer. I get that. But let's go back to that Orthodox rabbi again, writing in 2011. And he doesn't face any, non any pogroms. He doesn't face any anti-Semitic mobs. He boasted that Arabs were learning, as he put it, how to value a single human life, as the Jews do, from the solidarity campaign for Gilad Shalit. Now, do you notice something horrible in that? I, I mean, I, I, I hope I'm not overstating this, but this really bothers me. He says the value of a single human life, but which human lives does he mean? Right? Not Palestinian lives, obviously, not Arab lives, not non-Jewish lives at all. He's talking about solidarity of Jews with Jews and calling that life. That bothers me. There's a, 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 a th th this happens over and over again. And what you could say about these people when they do that is, are, you could say they're hypocrites. But honestly, it I think it's something worse, and it bothers me even more because and maybe this, maybe this will sound perverse to some people, but I would almost prefer it if these people would say, yeah, we know those people died, we don't care about them. We know those people died, but their deaths, they, they brought that on themselves. Or those people are not as valuable as we are. What scares me is I don't think they even thought about that. I, I don't think they noticed that somebody might raise the question. You know, we talk about the danger of dehumanization, and rightly so. But as long as you can talk about it, as long as you can decry it, as long as you can point to someone and say that, that person, that group, is at risk of dehumanization, then dehumanization hasn't succeeded, obviously, because you've got them there. But when they disappear entirely from your mental radar, that's when it's in full and ugly flower, and that's what scares me. And every student of traditional Judaism knows and must know there is something of that in traditional Judaism itself. Again, I'm not saying that's the whole thing. Believe me, I'm not. But as long as every Orthodox Jew prays in the morning thanking God that you did not make me a non-Jew. As long as every Orthodox Jewish prayer that we recite in our, in our standard liturgy speaks only of the welfare of, of Jews and not non-Jews, as long as we continue to apply and accept and embrace Talmudic laws that discriminate against non-Jews, I think it's not enough to prevent a political identification from creeping in to uh, traditional Judaism. We have to do something to purify the tradition itself. And that is something I am very much committed to. And here I, I do have to say I am a little bit different um, from most Orthodox Jews. And the way in which I would conceptualize the difference is this. Almost all Orthodox Jews that I know, certainly the ones that, that, uh, that make an issue of, um, of being public spokespeople for Orthodoxy, seem to assume, and it's always the things you assume that are the most devastating, because you don't question them. They assume that to be a religious Jew means that when you speak about it, you have to talk about the greatness and the advantages and, and the perfection of Orthodox Judaism. That seems, to, in their mind, to follow from the notion of faith itself. I don't. In fact, to me, it seems exactly the opposite. It seems to me that to the extent I embrace religion as a path of, of my perfection, it is my obligation to flay it. 
It's my obligation to seek out any imperfections in it, to ruthlessly detect them, try to correct them, repudiate them, because if I don't, I'm lying to myself. If I don't, I'm letting down the very thing I claim to believe in. If this is my path to perfection, I can't let it lead me astray at the same time. To me, to be an apologist for a religious system is actually to betray it, or at least to betray the ideal that is supposed to be behind it. Do you know the difference, by the way, between a, a Jewish pessimist and a Jewish optimist? I, I, I don't know if anybody does. A Jewish pessimist says uh, things can't get any worse. A Jewish optimist says, yes, they can. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> so in this respect, I have to say, I I'm a Jewish optimist. Uh, I, I think things could get worse. I think if we keep treading the path that we have blazed for ourselves so far, things could get a lot worse. But I also think, in some ways, they could get better. And I'm going to do something awful to you now. I'm going to read it to you. But it's in the book. I already wrote it down. And I thought, you know, as long as we're talking about religion and what it is, let me just quote to you what I wrote in the book. Because here the question was, what can we do to go forward? What would you, well, how, how could religion help? All right. When Schweitzer, and I'm, this is Albert Schweitzer I'm talking about, when Schweitzer was asked to categorize himself as either an optimist or a pessimist, he answered that his knowledge was pessimistic while his willing and hoping were optimistic. This might be called the articulation of a religious psychology one that refuses to accept the finality of what the mind knows when such knowledge can't keep pace with the will and hope that nourish a fully experienced human life. I find myself in instinctive agreement with Schweitzer, and this brings me close to a word with which I have never kept easy company. I mean faith. In the only dream I can recall in which the topic of religion arose directly, I remember asking an obscure figure, its identity unknown to me, how one can possibly believe in God. Live God, the stranger answered, believe in life. That's my text. Now, I still believe that. That's my advice. Thank you. I think we can do it, okay? I mean, I, I, and I would say this too. We live at a time of such crisis that it is really probably true now that either we come up with a way of radically transforming the possibilities of the future or we may just not have a future to talk about. What used to be thought of as a messianic utopianism could actually turn out to be our only realistic choice today. And just to be clear, I'm not talking about a messiah. And, I'm, and as far as uh, messianic, uh, utopianism, they can be kept in, 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 the, in the books that, where utopias belong. But I am talking about shared human ventures with shared human goals, driven by passions that transcend a single human life or a single human being to make a kind of world in which messiahs are unnecessary. That's what I believe in. And thank you very much for listening. All right, that's fine. That was good. Now you were fine. But I like it. You said what? A question. The way we plan it, we thought if we could do a four, um, four panelist kind of uh, presentation and then a break, but uh, you have to pee. Um, and so, <laughs> Unless you can continue, uh, but uh, we can take a sh kind of a short break, uh, enough time to buy a single oh. copy of your book, and I bought the uh, 2,000 uh, with me. And, and, uh, and I can't back. get published. Yeah. <laughs> That's for the uh, Or and don't forget, we're, we're going to have a, a question and answer yeah, yeah. session. Yeah. yeah. Where so, people can go after all of us. Yeah, and, and oh. we will have we will have. Uh, I, th I think it's a good idea to have a 20 minute break. No, keep going. We can continue. All right. All right. All right. You are really brave in, in, in America. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Ah, Michael. Oh, yeah, Michael. 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 Can you put these? Yeah. Uh, uh, what are you going to do? Sure. The bottom of the bottom of microphone. This is the uh, yeah, eavesdropping device. All right. Can you? Is, is that all right? All right. No break. No break. It's a marathon. No break, no break, no break. No break. All right, now, as some of you may, may have seen, I titled my talk The Quagmire of Current Political Terminology in U.S. Society. Now, uh, I'll talk about that a little bit, but I'll also vary uh, quite a bit from it as well. But I do want to start 
as I think people should when they have certain terms in their uh, title, I want to start with the definition. The simple definition of quagmire. A situation from which extrication is very difficult. Now I want to do something as an introduction quickly that I hardly ever do. I want to cite two op-ed pieces from recent New York Times. Uh, I rarely do it, but it fits here. Now, the first, and for two different reasons that tie in to what I uh, want to say. Uh, the, the first is an op-ed piece by Ann Barnard, whom uh, she's the, I know her, she's the, uh, Bay, she's the Beirut uh, bureau chief for the New York Times. And she wrote this. I'm going to read it very quick. I'm going to read a couple sentences. The world seems awash in chaos and uncertainty, perhaps more so than at any point since the end of the Cold War. Authoritarian-leaning leaders are on the rise, and liberal democracy itself stems under siege. And then she goes on to say uh, a few other negative things. And then she says, these challenges have been crystallized, propelled, and intensified by a uh, can, uh, conflagration once dismissed in the West as peripheral to be filed perhaps under Muslims killing Muslims, the war in Syria. And I want to use that as a jump off for the first thing I want to say. Uh, and uh, I think as opposed to uh, what you said, Stanley, about many people, and I agree, not knowing very much about Syria, uh, let me tell you that the group that I had in Washington, the think tank, called the International Council for Middle East Studies, uh, we know a good deal about Syria. We dealt with Syria for eight years, um, and uh, we are in constant contact. By constant, I mean every other day we're talking with people on various sides in Syria who do a variety of things. Now, what I want to here focus upon, though, uh, is really um, uh, what I will say is a clear quagmire, not only in Syria, but of course, as you probably know, in some other places as well. And I notice that in the title that Galad came up with, Middle East is part of that title. So that's why I'm starting. The quagmire that I'm talking about right now is in regard to U.S. policy. I'm sure many of you remember that when this uh, a crisis revolt broke out in March of 2011. The President of the United States, Barack Obama, within a week said that not only was Assad terrible and should go, uh, but that that would happen within six weeks to two months. Well, it's now over six years and he's still there. But that's not the only thing. Then, late in the Obama administration, uh, that uh, position had changed for a variety of reasons, obviously. One, that Syria had become much more complicated uh, than uh, either the president or the administration understood. Now, of course, Obama did a few other things as well. At one point, as you may remember, he said, I'm drawing the red line. That's the red line. Uh, for using chemical weapons, and then chemical weapons were used again, and we never heard again about the, uh, about the red line. If we come up to today, today, if one would ask, what is the U.S. policy in regard to Syria, it would be a very difficult question to answer. If we listen to the current president, uh, of course, we're fighting ISIS, uh, but since we're fighting ISIS, maybe we have to deal with, 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 with Assad. We also have the problem of Russia and Iran, and I could go on and on, but the terminology used has actually made, in some ways, the situation far worse in this country uh, where horrible things have happened. 22 million people, that was the population, 22 to 23, when the revolt broke out, Half, 50 percent of that population have been displaced. Some, many, of course, out of Syria as refugees, some in Syria. The latest things we've heard in our publications is that over 400,000 people have been killed. You can probably say that it's at least one and a half times more 
than the 400,000. It may be six or 700,000. I could go on and on. And then we have refugees around the world not being taken care of, many of them children. And now we have talk again here about doing what has been done, not letting many, if any, now not any, Syrians in. That's Syria. You may know that in Iraq, it was the United States that went into Iraq and that really caused the destabilization uh, of that country. Not that Saddam Hussein was such a grand good person, not at all. He was an assassin for people who didn't agree with him. But the country, even though with problems with the Kurds, was certainly stable in many ways. No, clearly, we, destabil we destabilized it. Lots of material on this. Uh, just let me mention that um, uh, uh, two of the people, that if you haven't read them, they have a book together and they have books separately that you should read on what the U.S. did in Syria are uh, Raymond Baker and Tarek Ismail, uh, who wrote a book together on Iraq, and they also wrote, uh, they also have written separate things. They're two of many, many who have talked about that. So what I'm saying is, we certainly have a fat there, not to talk about Israel and Palestine, which I assume you also uh, know a great deal about, with all of the terminology and with all of the talk and with all of the hopes and promises for peace and with all of the slogans that have come from many places, but from the United States of America, which has certainly supported one side, we also have a quagmire there that's next to intractable. Now, very quickly, the second op-ed piece is totally different. And it ties in to then what I want to get into for the rest of the time. And that's an op-ed piece uh, written uh, uh, by uh, a professor in California uh, um, called uh, Trump's Republican History Lesson. But what he really says, though, well, uh, Trump is no conservative because he's defined the term conservative so many different ways at so many different times that, number one, we don't know what he says, and then it's worse than that. But let me go on from there. That's my jump-off point. And my, my point here is that uh, in terms of this kind of terminology, this kind of terminology, it seems to me, holds in a far broader sense. Now, Stanley told us about the left. Uh, Gilad, some about the left. Uh, Gilad talked about the left as well. But I must tell you that I, and I think a good many others, as they should, have a great deal of trouble understanding what people mean when they talk new left. I know a great many people who say they're new left and their, and their positions are diametrically opposed to one another on a variety of things. Not to talk about some other terms, conservative and liberal. You may recall that when Dwight Eisenhower, some decades ago, became president at his first news conference, he was asked, are you a liberal or a conservative? What was his answer? I'm a liberal conservative. Now, if we then look at people right now today, columnists, other people, members of Congress for sure, people in the administration, the same thing holds. In, in other words, the language is vague and the language is ambiguous. I could go on and on with a good many other terms as well, and that doesn't make things better. It certainly makes things worse. It certainly makes things worse. Now. Now I want to come to uh, something that my friend Gilad Otzman uh, has written about in his first book, uh, and as he wrote about in this book. And I must tell you here that Gilad and I are good friends. When he had his first book come out and he came to Washington, uh, there was a big program planned where I was going to interview him, and there the boycott was pretty successful. They boycotted most people from there, but I'm the one who interviewed him, and I wrote about that, and we've been friends since, and we're friends who disagree, I won't say totally down the line in regard to what Gilad has written, but we disagree to a goodly extent. And I'm not here just to talk about uh, the fact that I disagree with Gilad Otzman, but I'm here to talk about some of the issues, and let me start with identity politics with identity politics. That fits, first of all, I'm suggesting to you, into what, I, into what I've said. A 
clearly defined term. The Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, which is the best of its kind anywhere in this country, in their long, long essay on identity politics, well, if you read that essay, number one, first time through, you'll have trouble understanding it. Why? Because of the different things that are mentioned. But identity politics, let me uh, give you a quick definition of identity. Uh, uh, Gilad did. This fits in with his de definition. And then I want to say a few other things. And this comes from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, which I suggest is a pretty good source for, th for this, even though the article is a bit confusing. Definition, a tendency for people of a particular race, social background, etc., to form exclusive appliances uh, 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 moving from traditional broad-based party politics. And then it ref goes on to refer to uh, political positions that are different, but uh, people take them and they identify them in terms of their specific group. Now, Gilad has written a good deal about this, and has said that is one of the very great problems, and that instead of that, really, I think I'm citing you correctly, uh, uh, the position is people should be talking in far more universal humanitarian terms about things that they oppose in this society or in other, soci or in other societies, and not just be coming at it from the perspective of one group and that group's positioning on certain I I I issues. I'm not opposed to that statement in principle, but I'm saying that that doesn't necessarily hold. There are a lot of people in various groups. I know a lot of them. My guess is many of you know a lot of them that are in one group or another that fits into this definition of identity politics, but they don't limit themselves only to criticizing in terms of one issue or, in critic or to criticizing uh, uh, things from the perspective of that one group. They also are broader than that and they go beyond that group at times. And here I'm reminded of a personal story that I'll tell as quickly as I can. Some years ago, uh, nine years ago, I, I went with six other people to Pakistan. We went to Pakistan um, uh, to, uh, we went to do a variety of programs. But the program that got us there was a program in Lahore that was planned by uh, one of the people who had one of the largest congregations, Islamic congregations in the country and a big school. And um, he planned three days whereby in the morning and the afternoon he would lecture in English, and he was a fiery lecturer. They told me that in Urdu, he was even more fiery. I could hardly imagine that. But he was very fiery, and uh, everything was not negative. Some of it was not negative at all. Uh, much of it was. But anyway, um, we then were the ones who were critical of him. Or we were, we were the ones who criticized. The second morning he came in, the first morning he talked about why there would be an Islamic State. He said there wasn't one yet. Uh, he then condemned Saudi Arabia. He said the first one would be Pakistan and Afghanistan, and then it would spread, and it would be all throughout the, the world. Well, we had a discussion, and we, of course, I was uh, disagreed with him. The next morning he comes in, and he started out by pointing to me and saying, Norton, I like you a lot, but I have to tell you this. Sometime soon, all the Jews in the world will be killed. Now, one of the people in my group, Ibrahim Abu Rabi, who put it together, who was a great authority on modern Islamic thought, said, how are you different than, how are you different than um, Osama bin Laden? And he said, uh, it, it's clear. Osama bin Laden says, human beings should kill human beings, and I'm totally against that. Allah is going to do it. Well, that was his point of view. But now my point here is that on that trip, everywhere we went, at those sessions and at other sessions all around the country, since I was the only Jew in the group, I was identified and I was introduced as the Jew. I was introduced as the Jew. 
Now, when that first started happening, I thought to myself, well now, do I really like that? But I decided quickly, yeah, that was all right. Why? Well, I figured if we're going to be able to talk, it's better to have one Jew there than not to have a Jew there. So that's how I was identified. But did that mean that I was necessarily in one kind of, Id of identity group where the only way I was going to uh, really criticize or do anything would be from whatever the perspective of that one group was? Not at all, because I don't really belong too many in groups anyway, and I'm not the only person that fits in, uh, fits into this, to this category. Now there's a good deal more, and so my, my problem is that in terms of identity politics, it seems to me there's something to the argument about some dangers, but there can easily be, and Gilad and I have uh, disagreed about this. There can easily be overgeneralizations, and certainly to put them to 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 put people in these groups into one category. I think that's wrong, and I also think it's wrong to put lots of different groups into one category. And now I come to the second major point, and the second major point has to do with well. Uh, it has to do with Jews, but it has to do with bell curve, and it has to do with cognitive el el elite, which Gilad writes about. And if you haven't read it here, if you haven't read it, well, you, you should read it. You should read it. And the idea, is simply put, simply put, is, and Gilad gave a little bit of this, is that, well, not all Jews, certainly not all, some number of Jews, they are in this group that has risen, that has... <laughs> Tremendous power and has risen and has taken over, in not taken over, influenced terribly more than other groups for a whole variety of reasons that Gilad talks about, such as a continuum, a Jewish continuum that goes back centuries. Well, the continuum is a problem, I would say to you, in and of itself. But in doing that, there is yet another problem. And the other problem is, well, who are cited, not just by Gilad, but by others as well, but certainly by Gilad, as he knows. One of the ones, and the last time Gilad was here in New York, um, I was at the program where he only talked about this one, and this one is Henry Ford and the International Jew. And he talked about how Henry Ford hit it on the head that not all Jews, a certain number of Jews, for a long time, and certainly then, that number of Jews had this enormous financial and other control as well in the United States, and that was a huge threat. And he talked about the book, four volumes, The International Jew. What he didn't say was, that's only part of the title. The other part of the title is, The World's Foremost Problem. Foremost. That means number one problem, and well, I could go on and on. Uh, the Dearborn Independent, which started to publish this, started in 1920, and for 921 issues, it kept publishing parts of that and included Protocols of the Elders of Zion. A good many, uh, 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 another one, one of the most classic anti-Semitic works, talking about the power of Jews. Now also, later in his life, Henry Ford, now, you know, one can believe the apology or not, but Henry Ford apologized for having said what he said, and he went back on his word. Well, my argument here is that is, number one, it's incorrect. That's the first part of the argument. The second part of the argument is it's a very bad example. It's a very bad example I would suggest to you to use. Now, I want to because I feel I must. I want to take another example, and I'm going to take this example, and by the way, Gilad and I have not only talked about this, but we corresponded about this. I don't know, we must have had 20 different emails in the last three weeks. And this is an article that appeared, uh, that Gilad wrote, uh, uh, on, uh, it's called the, the Passover Session, Yahweh and WMD, Weapons of Mass Destruction. Now, first of all, 
there is, uh, there are really two things I want to say about this. I'm going to highlight the one. But the first thing I want to say is, God also in his book, and he tells me this continually, and he does say this. He says it in his book. He says, now I'm not really focusing on the Jewish religion. He said, I'm focusing on Jews and only a certain number of Jews. Uh, he does focus on Jews. No, he does, huh? I, I, I focus on Jewish ideology. Jewish. Jew, all right, fine. All right, Jewish, I, I, and you say Jewish culture as well. But I'm saying that certainly, here we... I come like in synagogue. Hey, wait. But here we have an example. The quagmire of American political politics has all right, evolved wait. into a... All right, wait. Fuck you? Fuck you. <laughs> no, it's not, no. But, but it seems to me that this is, a, this is important to say because these are not just issues that Galad is raising. Galad raises them when... Uh, uh, these are issues that exist, and so I'm going at them here. And the idea is that, well, if we look at weapons of mass destruction, weapon, not only is that clear in uh, what is said and done during the Passover Seder with the ten plagues, and there's a big problem there, as you probably know, uh, if you read only the text, that's one thing, but if you don't pay attention to all of the uh, tradition and oral commentary, which it tends to explain that, it's not, I, I, I'm not a great believer in the explanations, but the explanations are something far different than just what the text may say. Uh, but the other thing is WMD, weapons of mass destruction. Well, what's cited here? What's cited here? The Manhattan Project, where the, great number, the greatest number of scientists as you know, who worked on the Manhattan Project happened to be Jews. Well, the, what does that mean? It doesn't mean that in this continuum that somehow goes back for centuries, in this continuum, that, that in the culture, in the ideology, and then for some number of Jews who acquire power, that there is this thing that leads them to weapons of mass destruction. Because, for example, Einstein was one of those scientists, uh, uh, doesn't tell us uh, uh, what the motivation for Einstein was to even work on that project, uh, whether one thinks it was a good idea or whether one thinks it was a bad idea. The same for Oppenheimer, and the same for the others as well. So I'm saying, but to talk about that, and to use that specification as to the threat that appears from a Jewish el 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 elite, I'm suggesting that is something that is a dangerous thing to do. But it's not just that it's dangerous, that's secondary. What's more important is that's an incorrect thing to do here in this society or in any other society. So Gilad and I, and he'll of course answer this, uh, we, uh, we do indeed as friends, we do indeed uh, talk, about, uh, talk about this as well. Now there is in this business of continuum, in the business of continuum, there's a great deal more to be said about where a lot of this comes from. Where a lot of the, or where a lot of this may come from, if one is going to allege that, and here again there are great problems. I don't have the time I, to go into this. Galad and I disagree on this. We disagree on, on what he ended his talk today on on the business of Athens and Jerusalem. Uh, in fact, I think I could cite Maimonides himself uh, uh, that would give a different version. Of, uh, of, of, uh, of that kind of that kind of syndrome or comparison uh, uh, showing that he in many ways not all because he disagreed with Socrates and he disagreed with Plato in many ways but he also agreed he was within that contingency and um, uh, it's not Jerusalem and Athens um, Gilad suggested to me that Leo Strauss whom he knows from me that um, uh, had a great influence on uh, my thinking, uh, synthesized Athens and Jerusalem, but even Leo Strauss didn't quite make that argument. My point here is, my point here is that in the continuum, it's not, it's not enough to say there's a continuum. You really have to show with a lot of evidence, you have to show the evidence that there's some kind of continuum 
that goes back centuries that then comes down and leads today to Jews, not just religious Jews. Gilad's right. He says, I'm not taught. Most of these Jews are secular Jews. But, the, but some kind of continuum that comes down that has formed some kind of constituency for these Jews to have risen to the position where they are, as uh, Murray and Hernstein say in their study, The Bell Curve, uh, uh, they've risen to the, a top level, maybe the top level, of the cognitive el elite, and therefore that's a huge problem. My suggestion is that the evidence is not really there to make that kind of, of argument, and that kind of argument also fits in to what I started out with, when I said, well, there's a problem generally that we have in terminology that is used, in terminology that, that, that is used without full or without accurate uh, description or definition. Now, I could go on and on, but why don't I leave it there? Okay? Um, well, let me just say this. We're going to take a break, but I find it interesting. And I'm sure you, well, you, you're not banned because you quit. I'm the one Jew in the panel other than Billy Adams who's banned from Israel. And the one person here who had nothing to say about Judaism, in essence. And with that, why don't we, how long is the break? Um, I think that we will take uh, 20, let's, let's do it twice. Uh, 20 or half an hour, what do we do here? All right. Well, 15 minutes and then we'll come well, back. We'll do, do 20 minutes, yeah. Norton. One minute. One minute. One minute. Like, uh, yeah, one minute. Norton, uh, there is one. It, it needs one minute, and then this will well, be well, the, the, the last answer. nail in my coffin. <laughs> uh, uh, I, 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 do you have an extra yarmulke? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this uh, is really okay. reducing itself to a to a, a, a debate among Jews no, over Jews. For sure, this is this but is. But I this have this sneaking suspicion that there are a lot of people in this audience that find it interesting, but also want to talk about the quagmire of American politics, the left of American politics, what's You're happening right. in London. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. But, but, uh, but yeah. this is exactly why we have Q&A, and this is uh, what we are going to do. Yeah, but uh, the two of you are starting out play, playing no, Counting Angels no, in the no, Head no, of the no, 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 one minute. No, no, I, uh, no, no. Okay, we are just that's, that's your position. Uh, okay, okay, Angel okay, okay. Uh, order. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, we are, what is going to happen now? We are not on us for one minute. I then will address. I try to address all Norton kind of in a, uh, points uh, uh, in one go. It will take me 10, 15 minutes, not more than two hours. Uh, and then, and then we will have Q and A, which is supposed to be the most uh, interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now this whole session, this whole session will be moderated by our friend Tom. So Norton, you go. One minute. The only additional thing, and I would have ended on this, is that Gilad will say something about it, I'm sure, is that what it comes down to when we were in our discussion, it comes down to a concept of chosenness, uh, chosenness uh, on behalf of Jews. In his most recent article, it all stays in the family. That underlines that as well, but of course, and I'm putting this to you, uh, Murray, one of your, um, uh, one of the people from the Bell Curve, yeah. uh, Murray uh, has written an essay uh, some time ago mm -hmm. where he talks about chosenness too, and he says that he talks about how good it is, as opposed to your view of negative. Okay, that's it. Thank you so much. <laughs> I one minute. Yeah. <laughs> okay. One minute. All right. <laughs> no, no, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I'm, I'm going to address... He has more than one. Yeah, I... No, 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 no. Let, let me be the 800-pound gorilla in the room, okay? There are a lot of people here that came to talk about a variety of issues that we all have a background in. This Fine. is, if this evolves into a debate over good Jew, bad Jew, no, Jews it's, it's suck, wrong. Jews are great, we lose what the meeting is about. Okay, 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 I'll, I'll tell you exactly what, uh, what I want to talk about. And uh, if it is an issue, we can move into Q&A. But I that's what I thought this was, was Q&A. He's grabbing 10. <laughs> it is, it, I think, 
that I can address. You're against tyrannical dictatorship. Yeah. So we're you know, going I, this way. I, I, but this is tyrannical dick. This is two fine. people saying Forget we're going to control a discussion over Forget Jews. No, <laughs> it's not just over <laughs> Jews. That's a By now, yeah. he could have been finished. The, 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 the reason that we that I, we have to address it because Norton is the only person in this panel who really criticized my work. So I'm happy to address his criticism and to present a model that will help you or everyone you talk to to understand the logic, the metaphysics behind Jewish power. If it's a, if it's a problem for you, you know, uh, but it will take me 10 minutes to explain uh, it. Yeah, 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 I, I. How about we put that to a vote? Yeah, I mean, look, yeah, yeah. put that to a vote. I'm not, I'm not interested. Let's, let's move on. Q&A. I don't want to hear you. Yeah. We can't hear you. We just want to hear your answer in 10 minutes. In 10 minutes. <laughs> Go, it's yours. Yeah, we want to hear okay. I mean, we went through a huge battle over. No, no, I, 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 I really don't, I really don't care, you know, because a, any question that we'll address, I can talk about, you know, you know, I'm, I'm sophisticated enough. Okay, I make it, sorry, you need a microphone. I'll try to make it as simple as I can. For 1500 years, European rabbinical Jews were, had been engaged in a very unique exercise. They used to marry, and they still do in rabbinical society, the sage, sorry, the sage, the, the young gifted rabbi with the daughter of the leading merchant. They created a society elite society that is based or specializing in mammon, in money, and scholarship. Scholarship, we mean Talmudic scholarship. Now, when it comes to the form in which qualities are distributed in nature, we usually talk about the bell curve. We are usually talking about the bell curve. The bell curve, if this is quality, let's say I, and these are numbers, we have very few, I'm, I, don't, I cannot think in fit, uh, we have very Eight feet. <laughs> All right. And the most most of us are in the middle. The same applies to gift, to cognitive ability. We have very few people who are stupid, and very few people who are clever, and most of us are in the middle. In European society, the elite. I do it like that so you can see it yourself. The elite was always a squash bell curve because aristocracy in Europe is defined by ancestry. So if you are the older son, you get the title. You can be stupid, you can be clever, and you are still becoming an aristocrat. However, when it comes to Jewish society, again, bell curve, the Jewish elite is here. And it is elite, rabbinical elite, people who specialize in mammon, in money, and in scholarship. And then, we have Jewish underclass. And the division between this elite and the underclass 
what we call shoave maim and hotve etzim, drawer of waters and drawer of water and cut, wood cutters. Ewers of yeah? Ewers of wood. Ewers of wood. Ewers of, yeah. of water, yeah. Yeah? Ewers yeah? of wood. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yeah? It's also a physical partition. This is East Europe, the Shtetl, and this is Western Europe. If you are clever, you are from the East, you end up here. American society used to look like that. American society looks now like that. Not because of the Jews, because of computers, because of robotics. American society is now identical with Jewish traditional society. I make it very, very short. Some of you heard me talking about it or read my papers about it. American society is in a case of cognitive partitioning. Now, the person who thought about it first was Richard Ernstein. He wrote the book, the infamous book, infamous book, sorry, I think you say here, <laughs> The Bell Curve. And he got into a lot of trouble because he was talking about IQ. And people say, what is IQ, you know? It only measures your success in IQ. Actually, his position was different. He said that IQ actually um, measures your adaptability. But Richard Ehrenstein also got into a lot of trouble for com comparing between races. <coughs> He said that if this is the white man in America, this would be the bell curve of the Jews and Asians or Orientals. That, that, that I challenge that this is not on, on topic. No, it is. It is. You will see. You will see in a second. I, I, give, give, me, give me two more minutes. Yeah. Gilead. Yeah, that's this, a, that's this, a, is, this is turning into something that this meeting was not no, supposed no, to be. I'm, I'm, I'm about. I'm, I, it is. No, it it's is. not. Oh, well, it's All right. How many people would like him to finish? Yeah, let him finish. There you are. Isn't that a majority? That's a majority. Okay. Uh, actually, I don't believe in democracy, so maybe I should stop now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm, 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 I'm really trying to make it as, as short as I can, and it's, it's not a very healthy for this topic because it's a problematic topic. But I think that this is very important. This is the most important I can tell you about America and the West. Richard Einstein said, if these are the white people, these are the Jews, Jews, Jews and Asians. Nobody gave him problem for that, and he said, these are where black are. And this was slightly outrageous and not even true. Because in fact, in Britain, black are ahead of the white indigenous people. So it's not even true. He then said, if this is the underclass, the black are represent overrepresented. And if this is the elite, clearly the Japanese the Chinese, the Korean, and the Jews are overrepresented. Now, the most devastating thing is, is that there is a certain element of truth in it. But within the elite, the Jews are more dominant. Why they are more dominant? Yeah. Because for 1,500 years, they were living in a cognitively divided society. So, the, so being in a cognitive divided society is something that is really embedded in Jewish culture. This explains, this explains, in my opinion, why Jews 
or Jewish elite, I'm talking about Jewish elite, Jewish elite is so dominant, is so dominant, so powerful, are to challenge, and I hope that this explains, and I'm not talking about genetics here, and I'm not talking about, about all those issues that were problematic, uh, I shouldn't bring the, the, the microphone, uh, and, uh, and, and I'm not talking about genetic or IQ, I'm talking about cognitive ability, and this is my answer to all your questions. Can I offer you an alternative? We had an agreement before we started. You said you'd give me 10, remember? <laughs> Tom, Tom, is, Tom is, will take care, will take care of it. Can I offer a new opinion on the same topic? Something I think we should get into Q&A. Yeah, I think. Yeah. And then we can talk about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. All right, all right but, but, but uh, this is where I knew this was what I'd like to do uh, is, first, is there a question anyone has out there that is aimed at Stanley? Or at anyone. At anyone, but particularly, I'd like to start with Stanley, if I may. Ah, sorry, 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 sorry. Can you talk about that? Why not today? What? Because there's a question, a question for someone else. A question for anyone. Okay. All right. Well, I have a question for you. Yeah. Uh, my question is on Syria. I heard you uh, mm -hmm. speak to the Syria. earlier. A little my louder. Question is, my question is on Syria and Assad. Mm -hmm. uh, just looking for some clarification. It, it seems to me like they don't seem in the same mold as the overthrow of Iraq, the overthrow in Libya. Is it the same in Syria? And I, Look, I, I, I'm not going to... People who know me in this audience know I don't duck anything. Um, the, the, the issue of Syria, we could spend a year and a half talking about Syria. There are people in the audience who believe the CIA fermented the Syrian, you know, in, in, in the, that the, the, the 30,000 people killed by Assad's father in, in 1982 or 83 was really a front operation for the CIA in, in planning in advance of Sandy Hook. We could spend a lot of time. Let me say this about Syria. I've spent a lot of time in Syria. Um, I, at various times, have been asked to serve as a advisor or, quote, consultant to members of the Syrian government, uh, to members of the Sunni community. Um, in all candor, uh, I'm in an awkward position and have basically swallowed my tongue for six years because as an attorney who represents Hamas, uh, which was based in Syria, and as someone who supported Assad's support for Hamas, and out of concern for one and a half million Palestinians, living in refugee camps largely in Syria, it was very problematic and I had to bite my tongue. Not long before, not long before, people can debate civil war, insurgency, you know, Hillary Clinton's godfather started it. Not long before that started, I was asked to come to Syria to engage in a series of discussions with representatives of the government, with representatives of the movements, various movements. And by the way, I have represented leaders of Al-Qaeda, so that deals with that in North Sharif. I also was involved with an effort that for six weeks involved my negotiating with ISIS. I've represented Hezbollah. I've also done work as a consultant with the Iranian government. Um, Russia is a completely different story when it comes to me. I'm no fan of Putin and haven't been since his days in East Germany and even as a, in the KGB in Afghanistan. I predicted years ago that the only hope for Syria was national reconciliation. And if there was not an effort to increase Sunni participation in significant positions within the government, this was all going to go to shit. Lo and behold, I wish I was wrong, and it's all going to shit. And I also spoke very clearly at the time about the need to keep Western and Eastern powers out of it. Now, I know there are those folks that say that Al-Qaeda and ISIS and, 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 and other Sunni groups in particular are led around by the nose by the West. And I have great problems with that because implicit in that is exceptionalism, and it's patrony, the notion that Arabs and Muslims need to be told when to rebel, when to resist, or how to fight is dictated by people that crawled out of a cave 500 years ago. I think there's a degree of exceptionalism that just divides the... 1.8 billion people in this world 
into groups that are controlled by the United States, groups that are controlled by Israel. Do I think the one area where I'm 100% on board, that Israel has played an active role since long before seven years ago in trying to overthrow Assad? Absolutely. Why? Because Assad was supporting Hezbollah and because Assad was supporting Hamas. So I've walked a tightrope for a long time. And the reason why I was very glib, quick, soft about Assad tonight was I recently was engaged in a series of discussions with people that kept talking about the secular, the secular resistance. And it's fairy tales. The only secular players in the entire region are Russians. No one else is secular there. And the left has fallen in love, whatever the new left, old left may be, with this notion that, that Assad is a secular movement, forget about Hezbollah, forget about the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, uh, the Sunnis are all working for Israel and all working, you know, Nashri. Uh, I've heard, you know, ISIS was, was created by the CIA just after Sandy Hook. So I was brief. Um, I think Syria is very complicated. Um, I predicted, and I still predict, that the only way this is going to be resolved is through national reconciliation. And I also believed, when the, as, as what occurred in Libya with the, the no-fly zone, that the arrival of Western powers to dismantle Syria, Syria no longer exists. It will never exist again. Is that an accident? No. Does it suit colonial agendas? Absolutely. The same holds true in Libya. The same holds true in Egypt. The same holds true everywhere. And for those of you who might mistake my, my problems with my brother here, Israel thrives on regional instability. The perpetual victim, the only democracy in the Middle East that has committed unspeakable war crimes for 70 years in pursuit of who knows what. So it's a complicated issue. Um, and I don't know if I answered no, your question. That's, that's, that's fine. Thank you. Okay. So. I could say a good deal about Syria too, but maybe we should go on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A lot about Syria. Yeah. This person over here? Yeah, thank you. To go back to what, Stanley, to go back to what you said at the beginning about the cult of personality mm -hmm. in our politics. I would like to know if you feel it ties in, or I believe, but I want to like know how you feel, how it ties into the general cult that we have in our society now, cult of money, cult of um, stardom. Cult you mean the Michael Moore syndrome? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we, we in how the we, West... How do we break that? How, how can we... We in the West, and in particular the United States, you know, we watch TV, that's how, you know, I, I posted something on Twitter the other day that went ballistic, it went viral. I said that, you know, Bill O'Reilly's big mistake was not learning the lesson when to quit TV. A serial sex offender's big mistake was learning not when to, was waiting too late to quit TV and run for president. <laughs> we live in a culture, in a society that is reduced to the beautiful. I mean, I love the fact that Susan Sarandon gets up there with a $700 million 401k speaking kumbaya. Every time Oprah tells me what I'm supposed to read, every time Michael Moore puts a new movie out talking about communities and people he's never had anything to do with, you're right. We live in a cult of personality. It predates the political cult of personality. It deals with athletes. Um, it, 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 it deals with Hollywood. It deals with political leaders. It deals with famous lawyers. It deals with politicians. How do you break it? You break it by what's going on, and I have a lot of faith in the young women and men in this country right now. Yeah. You know, there are a lot of people very depressed. You break it by young women and men, perhaps consumed initially with their own identity politics, but merging and developing and evolving in the streets, challenging, not looking for golden calves to lead them, but following their own heart, their own heads, and their own soul. I have belief in that, and especially with the idiot we have in the White House, who will guarantee it. I, I would like to add something about it, and I think that this was the topic of my talk. In order to sort yourself out, you have to learn to call a spade a spade. 
But you cannot call a spade a spade because you are governed by a tyranny of correctness that you yourself subscribe to. So if you want to understand how to solve your problems, you have to identify the elements within your society that are maintaining and sustaining this tyranny. And again, if you look at this annoying diagram, you know where to find them. Can, can I ask you something? Yeah. Let me, let me just ask one question. Yeah. Okay. As someone, I don't know whether you're familiar with the foundational documents of the United States government. Have you done I'm any research? Sure. Are you? Uh, well, I'm not sure. Be specific. Well, let me, let me start out by first asking yeah. you, other than the fact there were no people of color and no women, how many framers of the foundational documents in this country were Jews? I cannot. None. Yeah. Have you ever read the foundational document that was a compromise with the southern states to get it passed that was largely white, Christian, Protestant, Southerners that said blacks, slaves, were three-fifths human beings and denied women the right to vote for 150 years. But how is it relevant to what I'm saying? What is relevant is that in your continuum theory that it's been the the role, it's been the, 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 the this ident overwhelming identity process that has brought us to where we're at. We are a country that was built on the back of land, genocide stolen from Indians. Let me address it. Built by, I, built, I, by, I, by I, bu yeah. built, built by slaves and Orientals that were addicted to opium, which was brought in, in which we denied women the right to vote. So the process of what you consider to be Gilead identity politics was basically the resistance in this country uh, you, for 200 you read, years. You, you actually, uh, one of the few people in this room that uh, read this book, yes. and one of the things that I'm saying in this book, that, and I even mentioned it briefly today, the reason that political correctness introduced itself, and the same applies to identity politics, is for a reason. There was a problem. It's not that now we have a problem and, uh, and everything was great uh, 60 or 70 years ago or 200 years ago. You had a problem with slavery, with uh, r r racial uh, uh, discrimin discriminatory policy, for sure. This is very clear. What happened now, some people that were very clever introduced some new politics and this politics was actually set to save this country of its racist uh, problem and so on and so on and intolerance and we landed in a very dangerous corner and this is what I call the post political condition. When I'm talking against, ident against, against identity politics, I don't want to see b black people being discriminated or women being discriminated or Jews being discriminated. I just want to elaborate on a new dichotomy between the people who see themselves as Americans or English or British or Scottish and the people who see themselves as identitarians. Now in Britain, we had Brexit and, uh, and it, re it revealed that the country is pretty much split between the identitarians and the Brits. Exactly the same. The country is divided between the Americans, the people who identify themselves as Americans, and they can be women, white, black, and so on and so on, and people who identify themselves as identitarians. But can this I say is, something else? Yeah. First of all, the topic that I started with today anyway was um, uh, dealt with an ambiguity in language. And I mentioned left, I mentioned right, I mentioned liberal, conservative, lots of different views by lots of different people. I would suggest to you that when you use the term political correctness, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. I doubt that a week goes by, maybe five days don't go by, when I haven't talked with a variety of people, different educational levels, different political levels, and those people have different and varied views about what we would call or you would call political correctness. One person's political correctness is not necessarily another's and, and so to use that term in a general way and to use it in a general way and say that general way is the problem 
then I would say that simply is not the case. There are problems that lots of people have with what they consider to be political correctness, but they're talking about different kinds of political correctness. Norton, I don't, I totally Wait. don't, and don't agree because I offered here a definition. Now no, you can, I, my definition, saying. my definition is very simple. Political correctness, political correctness is the politics, refers to the politics that cannot be criticized. Now, now a lot, there are a lot of, there are a lot of, uh, uh, it appears in many different forms, but this is a working definition. We have lots of criticisms in this country. We have, a, granted, sometimes... You don't know what he's referring to when he says that? What? What Gilad is referring to when he says Zionism. what's not allowed to be spoken about? What's not allowed? In this country? Zionism. Issues Zionism. involving Jewish right. culpability yeah. and any... Well, wait a minute. <laughs> that, wait. wait. Here, even though uh, uh, Stanley got mad at me because he thought I was you know, talking too much about the Jewish stuff and so on, I'll say, look, that is one problem. That's not the only problem. He did try to censor you. It is for a different reason. Wait, that's not the only... <laughs> wait, wait. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. It's the only problem we're not allowed to talk about. No, it, uh, that's no, absurd. It's the only that's problem. absurd. That, that, that is absurd. That's absurd. That is absurd. That's absurd. Come on. Come on. No, no, no. I think, I think it is a variety of topics. You need, you need to get out more often. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Moreover, not only is it absurd as he's saying, it's also absurd that we can't talk about it. Listen, I talk about it, and uh, people I talk to talk about it one way and another every day. And they've talked about it. I'm 84 years old, and I've talked about it for at least 75 of the 84 years that I'm elected. But it's certainly okay. Okay, let's let's let's. I think that it, we understand. We don't have to agree. But let's let's continue. Okay. Um, Stanley, I got here late, but I picked up certain things. Um, you are this, and it has to do, God forbid that we should have to look to the young people. One of the politically correct things is feminism, and I was a card-carrying feminist. There's a lot of shit that goes down the river by the name of feminism. And so there's a lot of terrible, terrible political correctness um, in Your this country is? now, which is not just about Jews, but it's all it's the whole what about the bloody fucking feminist agenda, which is anti-life. Let, 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 let's stop this question, please. Let's 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 question and answer period. No, and that's what, with respect to Jews, what's really important you may have been born here, but America was actually where Jews flourished in a way that they didn't in Europe. So don't go question. on about... What's the question? I think she was making a point I'm that there's more than one I thing just, involved we, in we, we have right, yes, we have no, Okay, okay let, let's, let's try to concentrate on questions. But it let's was, not all make it to the Jews, because there's a lot of politically correct things. Uh, this gentleman with the suspenders here. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, I remember when... Um, a lot of the uh, political correctness began to be uh, introduced. I was of college age at that time, and uh, uh, there was a, a big anti-war movement. It was called SDS. A lot of the thinking was transitioning towards, hey, the Vietnamese are making a, a working class based revolution of some sort, and that's really what the solution is, not just being against uh, a war which is an outgrowth of the capitalist system. And so there was a, uh, a new, um, th this new left wanted to see a working class revolution, but they ran into a stone wall, which was the backwardness of the entire, it wasn't even that there was like uh, overt racism or something, there were attitudes, like uh, there used to be a, uh, the respectful term for black people used to be called Negro. Yeah. And that was changed, that was challenged. A you lot of people were- You have a question, yes. specifically. Yeah. Yes. I'm, I'm asking, uh, uh, I just want to ask how the, the um, uh, political correctness, see like right now it's challenged by say the, uh, the Fox uh, uh, pundits. 
Yeah. They say, we, we can't have this political correctness anymore. They want to be politically incorrect. They want to say we're racist. That's okay. My friend, well, we know each other 30 years. Yes. Right? Excuse me? What's your question? Okay. What's the question? The question is, <laughs> how can the, the uh, political correctness, which is alive today among the people that are conscious, that want the world to change, many of them want a working class revolution, but they're stuck in one particular sector of it. Sex. How can that be used Sex. to create? Sex among men and men, women and women, black and white, okay. Hispanic and green. The, the question is, how can that be used to generate a respect among the different sectors of the working class so that they can get together based on a sense of justice? And based on that, unite people uh, uh, for a, uh, a, a more just society, which can only be working class based, but including and respecting all of its different sectors. You said sex, yeah? Yeah. I say truth. Well, truth. Truth. What I mean by truth? Yeah. I'm referring here to the Greek notion of truth. I don't know the truth. For the truth. Mm -hmm. One, my problem with political correctness is that it removed us from truthfulness. We don't say what we think, we say what is right to be said. And this is a disaster. We have few jazz musicians here in the room. When you play, you have to play the truth. If not, it doesn't sound right. Let, 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 let me add something in response to that, that that's going to make one person happy and one person sad. I wrote, I wrote a piece about this. And it was when, um, what's his name, the head of the NAACP, when Greenberg died, the NAACP leader, and everyone started bowing and praying and cooing and fawning and loving and laughing because God had left us. There is a myth that has been perpetrated among the civil rights movement in this country, which also deals with identity politics, that basically it was going nowhere until a handful of Jews from the north went down to show black, uh, blacks from down south how to beat the state. It was a myth that was perpetuated, and it's utter rubbish. Uh, the fact of the matter is SNCC, the fact of the matter is most of the militant black resistance that broke the back of Jim Crow down south was, was directed, organized, and led by African-American young women and men with the arrival of northern whites, northern Hispanics, and northern Jews. But the myth that's been perpetrated is that it was the arrival of Jews from the north, especially the lawyers from the north, that came to save the day. And when Greenberg died, I got you know, shunned in the community because I wrote a piece about how he crossed the picket line of a quote militant black law school association of law students at Yale because they were boycotting the fact that he got a position to teach in a civil rights program, the Thurgood Marshall program, that an African American lawyer did not. So there are myths that at times build to various crescendos and to get back to truth, I think you're absolutely right. I think ultimately the way you deal with politically correct the way you deal with identity politics, the way you deal with censorship, is the marketplace of ideas which will always produce the truth, even for those of us who don't buy it. Okay. Um, before we continue, you're all very intelligent people, that's why you're here, and <laughs> you've got great things to say. I just urge you to formulate them in the form of a question rather than um, making a big statement. I'd love to hear what everybody has to say. I'm sure we all do, but in the sense of time, please use your, your good intelligence to take what you would have said in a, in a spiel and put it into a concise question for the audience. Thank you. This lady here. Can you just please, uh, are people aware of Wesley Clark's cry in a way? If you want seven countries in, in five years or something, now there's about two that are left. So this destabilization of all the countries that are being bombed, uh, and, and, and deplacing all these people. This is not an accident. This this is absolutely a In time blue, what? What? What did you say the reason is? It, it's, it's certainly not an accident. accident. It's not an accident. Yes. yes. So, 
So what I mean what is, is it? Well, what it is is empire, and that's the elephant in the room. And and oh, we need questions, really. Well, that's, in order to get it right. I'm asking. I, in other words, what I'm is saying is this is a military. Uh, we are totally addicted to the military, and if we don't see that, nothing else matters because. You know we're going to not. Let, let me forever. say something to that, and I may have said it. I said it earlier in a discussion with someone. And again, there's there's a component of exceptionalism in this, that 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 is not you. With all due respect, that's an arrogant notion in both the West and the East that Arabs and Muslims don't have the ability to formulate their own opinions of when and where and when. I remember in Algeria, in the 50s. I don't think it was the CIA that overthrew the French. And in Algeria in the 50s, when all the Muslim men were arrested and put in prison, the Muslim women were the ones who went on martyrdom operations. I don't disagree with your premise that this is colonial empire. I mean, Lawrence of Arabia remains one of the biggest movies in America. People Wesley buy that Clark. crap. Wesley Clark. Yeah, but Wesley Clark. Oh, you know, there is, there is one way to look at this issue. And I don't know, I don't know, uh, I, I may get the figures not exactly right, but I, I looked into it and I, I realized that the average salary in America is more than $50,000. I think it's $54,000. Yeah. Uh, I know that my friend, jazz, jazz musicians are not there. <laughs> uh, but, but the average salary in Germany, which is a way more productive country, is 24. Britain is 22. When it goes to China, uh, Korea, uh, Japan, its way under, which means that you cannot sell cars, you cannot sell pianos. The only thing that you can sell is death. It is very simple. <laughs> so when you find us that you're in the morning that your country missile the, the 56 Tomahawk missiles or whatever it was, this is a lot of money. This is what it is. This is your only productive industry in this empire at this time. It's industry of death. In Britain, we are the same. Again, how do we change it? Production. Well, how do... The second one is, is, is putting black people in prison. But by the way, by the way, you are absolutely right. It's this, exactly the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. We are only engaged in abusive, destructive, Industries because we, because we don't have to market them anywhere. Right. <laughs> uh, top ten. Me? Yes. Yeah. I like to ask Norton to give us. Will you give us your view of Syria? Yeah, I'll give you my view. Of Syria. Uh, well, let me talk a little. Let me talk just very quickly about background first of all, because views are about a, Views are usually as important as. Um, uh, the sophistication from which they come. Now, Stanley had, he told us his background. He had a good deal of background. I mentioned it before, so have I for 30 years at least uh, uh, dealing with Syria, and for the last eight years uh, dealing with it in terms of the International Council for Middle East Studies, of which I'm a member, where we have Middle East people and Syrians. And also, I Three times with, was with President Assad. Um, you say you represented Hamas. As I, I was with Khalid Mashal while they were there. Uh, I saw him three times. So on, so on, so on. Lots of people right now. Uh, and so I think that I have some knowledge. Now, I would agree with much of what Stanley said about it's being, number one, it's being an enormously complicated problem. I think I said that. Number two, uh, I also think that there's going to have to be, if there's going to be a solution, there'll be a solution sometime. It may be a solution of no Syria whatsoever. Uh, it may be a solution of a much smaller Syria of one type or another um, uh, with some other types around or not around, but it's going to have to be something that is coordinated. And I don't know how long Bashar Assad will himself decide that he's going to stay. Certainly he's been uh, resolute, it appears, about uh, wanting to stay. But if he does want to stay, uh, then I think there's going to have to be some kind of uh, 
joint get together. There's going to have to be the kind of thing that Stanley talked about, for sure. But it's going to be it's going to be difficult. Now Syria, as many of you know, I'm sure you know, Syria before this started, before this started, even I mean rather recently before it started, started in March of 2011, the revolt, which was not the kind of revolt it then became. Uh, but um, uh, before that, Syria was something different than the other countries in the Middle East. It had not every known Islamic group, but it had most of the Islamic groups were represented larger or smaller in Syria, and it had up to 27 different Christian groups. And not totally, sometimes there were difficulties, but for the most part, for a long period of time, they actually got along with one another. Now that faded away. Syria, unfortunately, was under the rule of Bashar al-Assad's father, Hafez al-Assad, for a quarter of a century. And then Bashar came and didn't carry through with the reforms that some people thought he promised. So all of that makes it far more complicated with the, of course, addition of groups like ISIS coming in, and then the addition of other powers, other powers, the United States being one of them. Well, anyway, I could go on and on, but that, but if, but. Uh, we don't have solution. Uh, <laughs> no, we have no solution right now whatsoever. We and don't have right, no solution, we have no right to be there. Exactly. Not okay. Okay. Well, wait a minute. Let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. I'm not saying they have a right to be there. I don't think you ought to be there with any military. But what about this? Right now, right now, there are millions of Syrian refugees, and a great number of those Syrian refugees are small children who are starving. And don't who's you fault think? Is that? Wait a minute. Who's fault is that? Wait a minute. Wait, I'm not done. Don't you think that we have some kind of humanitarian duty to take in some of those people? No. No. Yeah. No, we do. We, we, we went in there and destroyed that country. We didn't do it. Yes, we did. We did. Yes, we did. Yes, we did. Yes, we did. All for the queer in Israel. Where did the children go? Yeah. Right, no, I mean, it definitely wasn't Norton who led the... the I, I think we can all agree on one thing, that we have a, an extreme humanitarian duty to never go into a place like that in the first place, okay? I think that's the first point. Refugees don't flow after that, okay? And there's no refugee problem to deal with after that. I'm going to invoke a privilege for a moment because I got a great deal out of Michael speaking, and I notice there are no questions being directed to him. So yeah. if I may, with the audience, direct the question to Michael. Uh, it's not going to be that painful. But <laughs> you, you uh, spoke eloquently about this, uh, this uh, mixing uh, of religious, traditional, as I understand it, practically the definition of what a Jew is, to the political side, that there, there, there's sort of a, a mixture happening. It sounds like a dangerous thing to me, a volatile thing. Uh, is this new? Has this been happening since the emancipation or something? Or is this a relatively new thing? And how do you see it going? Uh, if I may. I'll give a bit of an answer. Actually, Norton may have something to add to that also from the point of view of this scholarship. I, I would say, and I'm a dilettante in this, um, it was a problem that to some extent was waiting to happen since the emancipation. It really seems to have come to a head in the late 19th century, which is hardly surprising because the late 19th century was the heyday of romantic nationalism. Um, Heinrich Kretz, the, the, the great Jewish historian of the later 19th century, decided that he, in his writing his history, would have to conceptualize Jews in, with the same nationalist uh, uh, model uh, that, was, that was being used to explain German history, French history. I mean, anybody living at the time and watching the Italian Risorgimento, thinking of the Greek independence movement and so on, would naturally be, so, be excited by this idea, and he wanted to apply it to the Jews. What tends to be forgotten today, and I'm, 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 I'm happy to see that Shlomo Zan in his uh, book, Invention of the Jewish People, re resurrected this, the great Jewish historian of the early 19th century, Marcus Jost, did not agree with that. He saw Jews entirely as religious community. Uh, that, that really was a traditional idea. It's, it's a much newer idea that I would really date from the early 19th century that Jews can be looked at as a nation. And then, of course, the Zionist movement picked up right on that idea. It was not a religious idea. And they, they were quite explicit in saying it wasn't a religious idea. But it has now come to, to, to um, I guess I will say, infect uh, a lot of religious thinking as well. 
I hope that helps to answer the question. I don't think it's yeah, no, it, it, it seems to me like that there's a toll that is going to take place in what used to be a purely religious uh, domain getting mixed in with this politics now that could reflect yeah. poorly on uh, on both. Is, 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 is that a concern, that there is a, an unhealthy uh, mixture? You know, you know what the irony is? Let me just, you know, because... I represent Natari Kata and a lot of the Satmar community. The irony of it is, the most religious Jews are least supportive of the state of Israel. <laughs> the most, certainly the most traditionally religious Jews. Traditionally. Right. Right. The most right. traditionally Orthodox Jews are least supportive. Now, there is that argument that just because they don't want to go into the military doesn't mean that they're opposed to it. Uh, but the reality, and you well, know this, really the, the reality of it is, the biggest problem that 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 Zionism has in Israel today is a birthing population of 7.9 kids in extreme orthodox families that don't recognize the state. And there are many of them that live outside of Israel. Oh, I, I, uh, I have, uh, sorry. Uh, go ahead. I want no, to okay, just one, one short comment. I would be happier about all this if it were also true that these people objected to the Israeli policies of oppression and oh, theft yeah. and murder and yeah. so on. I mean, yeah. from their point of view, it's entirely theological. Sure, they just don't. They, they just bow don't. out politically, <laughs> and, uh, right? And that, that that bothers me. I mean, you know, it's not really true that a stop clock is right twice a day. A stop <laughs> clock may coincide with the correct time twice a day, but it's not telling time if it's not running. And this is my. You're right. I, I'm I'm happy to see that the, the traditionally religious Jews are not keen on Zionism, but I wish they were also more keen on what happens to non-Jews in the name of Jews. Well, no one is in Israel. We have to be a little more specific. We have to be a little more specific about the religious Jews now. Before the state came into existence, certainly before, and certainly before the Holocaust, the tremendous majority of Orthodox Jews and Orthodox rabbis were totally opposed. They were opposed to Zionism. They were opposed to the creation of a Jewish state. They were, they were, they were opposed to Jewish nationalism. That's not the way they define their religion at all. They were totally opposed. And not only were they opposed, but they understood that, that, that their rabbis for the religious, their rabbis had told them, and their rabbis uh, uh, allegedly got it uh, from on high. Their rabbis had told them, listen, there will be no such thing as any kind of Jews in the Jewish state until the Messiah comes. And then we don't even know what state means because it's not going to mean the same as it's meant here. They were totally opposed. Totally opposed. Now, it's true that after the Holocaust and with the influence of the Zionist movement in some ways, there were some religious Zionists. They had a different theory. They, they, they didn't disagree with the Talmudic sages who said that the Messiah had to come, but they said that their leader was Rabbi Cook the Elder, and Rabbi Cook the Elder said, no, we have entered the Messianic Age. And since we've entered the Messianic Age, it's all right for us to work for the state. They were in a striking minority. Now, in a sense, that changed. That changed. But then we have to be specific about the change. Right now, we have different groupings. We have the settlers who are the most extreme. They're in the Rabbi Cook tradition. We have a lot of others. We have a lot of others. Not so much the Satmers, but if I go to the Hasidic groups, if I go to the Lubavitchers, which I know extremely well, with the Lubavitchers, the Lubav they, have, they had seven Lubavitch rabbis. Uh, the last one was Menachem Schneerson. Uh, they aren't uh, right now going to anymore for a number of reasons. But anyway, the three before Schneerson, and he came, and he became the rabbi right as, after World War II, the three before him were extreme anti-Zionists. I've done the research, I've written on this, all you have to look at is, now, Schneerson's different, but how is he different? All you have to do is go to the internet and look up Eyes Upon the Land which the Lubavitchers put out in the 1990s. That's Schneerson's position. They're still anti-Zionist. They, these Lubavitch rabbis, with a few exceptions, will just say, of course we're not Zionists, but they are fierce defenders of the state. They are 
enemies of the Palestinians, and so on, even though they're not necessarily among the settlers. And what's the argument? Schneerson put it. He said, we have the land now, and we have to keep it, because if we don't, the Arabs will kill all six million of the Jews that are in Israel. Well, that's that kind of emphasis within Orthodox Judaism. So I could go on, but you have to be, we have to be specific about how we look at this breakdown. Thank you all for allowing me the uh, privilege of asking. I thought that, that it, it would Michael, add. Okay. Uh, okay. Could you talk more about Robert Nielsen? About what? About Rabbi Schneerson. Oh. About Schneerson? Yeah, could Michael speak more about Schneerson? I, 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 really, I really don't have that much to add about him. I, I'm not a Lubavitcher, didn't know. I mean, I've, written, I've written a column Lucky about him. You. Him, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a very, very good scholarly that. book to read, but you have to, you, you, you don't have to use a dictionary for some of the philosophic terms. If you want to know about Schneerson, some of the Lubavitchers, and there's a big question about the name of the book is. I'm, I'm going to give, tell you that in a minute. <laughs> I'm so, sure. Some some of the Lubavitchers believe that Schneerson was is the Messiah. Was the Messiah? They have they're around town. Others don't necessarily say that, but that's a very important consideration because they all follow the Rebbe. And the best book is written by uh, a professor at NYU. His name is Wolfson, and it's called Open Secret. And it's about the views of Schneerson and the messianic views of Schneerson. If you really want to get an in-depth view, as you asked me, of Schneerson and, and his views, you should go to the Wolfson book. Okay. Uh, this gentleman here with the jacket. Okay. Um, I have, um, first of all, I'm going to say the question, just to get the question out of the way. No comments, fine. <laughs> sure. All right. So the question is, what's the solution? For what? The, for what this is what I'm... I, we're, we talked a, a lot, you talk, guys talked a lot about uh, political correctness. Even when you didn't talk about political correctness, you really kind of did talk about political correctness, all four of you. Because um, I'm... <laughs> sorry. Uh, my, my question is, how do you think my generation and... I'm looking around, you know, I'm one of the, probably one of the youngest people here. Uh, and you, I think you guys give, uh, some, some, somebody said something here about my generation. And, and please, do not, no. My generation is fucked. And, and I know you try, you, you, people are optimists, but, but this is, you know the political the political correctness that the, the social unconsciousness people don't understand people don't know what they they're just being a herd so to for to me I, I mean what do you think the solution what how do you see things let, let, let me be at North how, North why are you an optimist let, let, why am I an optimist yeah what, because how, as an attorney who has represented every major youth movement in this country for the last 30 years, I see more and more and more young people taking an active role, and I'm not talking, who gives a shit about Trump? Talking right. about local political <laughs> responses, talking about local community organizing, talking about confronting the state, talking about writing anonymous, even WikiLeaks in its heyday releasing information. I have, look, do I think there's 50 million American people, your peers, out in the street? No. Unfortunately, many of you are worried about you know, your mortgages when you don't even have a home. Right, right. I have a lot of faith and a lot of respect in the drive of a lot of young women and men in this country, all over this country right now, who are in the streets. Even if it's only a thousand people at a demonstration yesterday about Trump's new environmental policies. Mm -hmm. I come from a generation where my generation stopped the war by staying in the streets for a long time and but getting our ass kicked. That, no. That's what I'm saying. I will, I will, I will tell, you, I'll tell you the complete oh, opposite. Okay. The complete opposite, and don't be offended, give me a chance. Because it sounds offensive. I'm actually optimistic because of Trump. This is Friday. Why because of Trump? Why? Why? Let me let me let me tell you why. Not because I support Trump. Right. I don't give a toss. Right. I'm optimistic because in spite 
And this actually confirms something that uh, Norton uh, said before. In spite of political correctness, and in spite of identity politics, and we already saw that we are living in a progressive uh, dystopia, or even it depends what side uh, you take, suddenly, a populist guy, who actually didn't mean a word he said, managed to prove that American people, American is that, people... Is that populist, you said? Po populist, not popular. Po popular. Populist, popular. No, he's a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a populist, you know. He's definitely populist. You know, and, and as well as popular. Managed to show us... Is populist? Populist. Populist. He's a working class hero. Yeah. Yeah. Managed to show us that actually a lot of people are upset. Trump in himself, himself is not important at all. He's just a symptom Look, of American but they were fatigue. Upset one minute he's a symptom. One minute, one minute, one minute he's a point. symptom of American fatigue. Look. Brexit is a symptom of British fatigue. Le Pen is a symptom. Yeah, but they don't of understand Brexit. their what, own what, fatigue. What? That's the whole point. Look, they, whether they understand or not, we are going to know so now. Why I also am happy with with Trump at the moment. He won't be because, here long, don't worry about it. <laughs> so I think that you're right. I think that you're right. Because, it doesn't matter because anymore, his betrayal, I mean. his obvious betrayal, his obvious betrayal galvanizes the situation. All right? So we are actually in a good position. And Lorcan is here in the room. He's kind of he's sitting there, behind, you know. Do you think, do you think that we could have this discussion in this room with this panel, with me, Gila Datsmon, and uh, this uh, lunatic Weinberg shouting, would we be able to, to have this discussion a year ago? I'm not so sure. A year ago? There is a, there is a shift in America, whether you like it or not, shift of consciousness. We still don't have production. We didn't okay. stone have a reason to wake up in the morning. So you feel okay, the shift. Right, 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 right. I want to say one thing. First of all, I agree in part with Stanley's answer to you mm -hmm. about it. But in, a, in another way, I, that's on the one hand. But on the other hand, let me know, I'm 84 years old. Okay. I've been an academic. I've been an academic since I was in my mid-20s. Well, even before. That's when I got my PhD. Mm -hmm. And I've taught and I've been on university campuses. And I see a lot of students and I still see a lot of, 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 of students. And I see a great number of them who fall into, I'll just generalize this, the category that you talked about when you said you were not pessimistic, you were not optimistic about how your generation is today. I see a lot of them who aren't interested don't care much except for what they're doing that day and what kind of job they're going to get, mm -hmm. are, are less sophisticated, less intelligent, less interested when they're in the, these are, now I'm talking university students first of all, less right. interested than many students have been before them and so on. So I'm saying that, well, on the one hand, I think with some, and I'm not the only one, my, I, listen, I of course do what other professors do. I talk with lots of my friends who are professors all over the country and there's now we don't disagree about this. That is there's on the one hand and there's on the other hand. So but I would say I am still optimistic and why am I optimistic? Not because I have I think a preponderance of evidence that would say this optimistic hand is going to win out but rather because I want to be optimistic and I hope that's going to be the case. Right. Okay, from the side of the room, uh, sir. Thank you, yes. Okay, uh, I'd like to ask a question about uh, Jewish traditions and Jewish uh, history and how it's influencing what's going on right now. Uh, we all agree with freedom of speech. We also agree with freedom of association, but you can't have that without freedom from association. Without what? Freedom from association. From? Like you the, have freedom from, yeah. Yeah. But you, if, if you cannot choose, then there's, there's some form of totalitarianism. What's going on now with refugees and migrants? The, the preponderance of those coming into Europe are economic migrants. There are indeed refugees, but there are many who are using that as a cover, and they're being led in. Same thing is happening in America. 
I won't get into the morality of it. What I'm getting into, though, is that a lot of it has been influenced by Jewish ideas, whether they're sociopaths like George Soros, who's financing a lot of this stuff. He is. Uh, with people in Europe. And there's also a group called Isra Cares, which is a charity based in Israel, which is based in Europe and facilitating the, uh, uh, the uh, assimilation or the, the uh, acculturation of the new, the new Europeans. And most of the rabbinate uh, uh, of, uh, uh, in Jewish countries, both in Europe and Israel and elsewhere, are very pro-immigrant and pro-migrant. Every, but every place but Israel, it has to, has to be said. So my question is, how is it that the Jewish history of diaspora has influenced this, if that is something that can change or should not change or will change now that Israel exists in, in this Let me say two things first. Sure. One is anecdotal. You know, everyone is 1 16th Cherokee in this nation. Everyone is 1 16th Cherokee. Well, I happen to be very lucky that my partner of 23 years is Mohawk. And she, her entire family was born, her entire family lives in Agwazasne, the Mohawk territory on the Canadian border. And whenever she sits around and hears people talk, say the word illegal alien, her response is, get the fuck out of my country. Everyone. So my question to you is, where are you from? Originally. Cleveland, Ohio. Originally. Your father, your grandfather, your great-grandfather, where? My, my, my grandparents were born in Europe. They were born in Eastern Europe. Okay. So you're an immigrant. They were, they were Scandinavians. Did, did they come Canada. here because of the Jewish diaspora, or because of economic repression, no, no. or because they wanted an opportunity to I, become was, something? That's not the question I was asking. Well, but that's the question. And America, America's, America's, <laughs> history, no, America's history is of welcoming in or bringing in new cheap labor. Okay, that was all. It's always historically been about cheap labor, and once slavery then. That's factual. There's a problem with, I'll tell you what the problem, the biggest loss, in the, in the days after 9-11, when most of the liberal bar in America was running around and hiding, saying kill Muslims, I was one of the few attorneys, including the ACLU, going all over the country, talking about rights and freedom and liberty and breathe in and breathe out and get your shit together. To whatever extent this country, to whatever extent this country has excelled in science, in math, in the arts, in music, it's because we have welcomed people of color, people of different backgrounds, the best and the brightest of the entire world. And that, to whatever extent, to whatever extent we've been able to accomplish with all the evil, and here's where we're getting fucked. Since 9-11, we have turned it into, you have to be a certain color, a certain religion, a certain body politic, or you don't get in. And now, with the executive order, I'll tell you what's happening. We spoke before about the rest You're of the lying. world. You're lying. Don't insult them. I'm lying. I've only litigated this issue for 30 years. So? Okay? Horseshit. Okay, it's horseshit. The difference is the best and the brightest from all over the world came here for a very long time. And right now, we have closed our borders, except if you are involved in economics in Saudi Arabia with Trump, and then that's different. That's a different lesson. Uh, you're lying. I'm lying. I will address your question, if you, oh. if you don't mind. And actually, it is slightly embarrassing uh, to admit that, uh, and I'm not an anti-immigration, I'm an immigrant. I was born in occupied Palestine and, and I live now in Britain for 20 years. So I'm not against immigration. I'm very lucky uh, to, live, uh, to live in Britain. But it is unfortunately true that Jews, Jewish intelligentsia, was uh, amongst the, the elements that uh, supported and advocated the uh, immigration, and this is again because of the reason that I mentioned in my talk. For Jews, it is better to live in a society that is fragmented and, and, uh, and uh, sectarian. Now, what is interesting about it is that at the same time, and I'm not original here, some, some of you know it, 
Israel is the most anti-immigration country in the world. Now, this also can be explained with the geopolitical, uh, you know, uh, you know, and uh, My Michael can uh, elaborate on it, you know, uh, from a uh, Jewish perspective. It all can be explained, but this is the truth, and we have to, we have to admit it, we have to accept it. It's something that no one can deny. So, your question is spot on. Is spot on. There is an there is an element of uh, truth there that we you have to admit. You want to refute this Soros bullshit? We're going to let that stand, that George Soros is orchestrating the mass migration I know, from okay, Syria okay, okay. and all sorry, these places. Sorry, sorry. When it comes to George Soros, when it comes to George Soros, we have to look, we have to look into, uh, into uh, his uh, politics. I don't think that the Soros uh, pushes uh, people around, but it, that we have enough evidence to suggest uh, that uh, George Soros is actually supporting a lot of... Uh, pro-immigration uh, lobbies, and I assume that some people in this panel will and actually... Is there, be... is there a concerted conspiracy behind that, other than open borders, open... This is 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 the question. This is a question that demands, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, three hours uh, three hours discussion. Yes, I you not have sure. an answer to that. You've yeah. given your answer about George Soros. Yeah, is I believe. Sufficient evidence? I believe. I don't believe. Okay, I'll be very simple. I'll be very simple, and you, you all will be able to take it on with you. I don't believe, as I mentioned in my talk. I don't believe in Jewish conspiracies. As simple as that. Jews do everything, everything in the open. The tactic is different. You just cannot talk about it. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Other than, other than African Americans in this room or Native Americans, okay? How many people in this room our first, second, third, fourth, fifth generation. Me the liar. Where are you from? Where's your family from? Me? Diverse places. Some Italian, some English, some Quaker. Okay. You're an immigrant. My yes? ancestors were, yes. Everyone in this room except those that are slaves, ancestors of slaves. No, no, no. We always get into this. That we forget. is the watershed Listen, listen. We forget that in this neighborhood, the Lower East Side, going back to the 19th century, it was filled with Irish and Italian and Jewish and Spanish and French immigrants that were escaping all sorts of shit everywhere. But all of a sudden, all of a sudden, when we come to the question of immigrants, it's like, oh, no, we got to shut this shit down. Now. We're here, but Gentiles fuck Gentiles everyone else. Gentiles from Israel, sir. Uh, uh, can Gentiles except go, if you're a descendant of a slave. For Israel be an ethnic state, but listen, no listen, state. Nah, fuck Israel. I don't support Israel. I've sued them 20 times. I'm banned from Israel. They would kill me tomorrow. Is I don't give a shit about Israel. But what anywhere. we are talking yes, about, yes, when you start yes, talking about immigrants and refugees, I don't know anyone who's a Native American here. Who's a Native American here? Anyone? Oh, yeah. We got 116 Cherokee? There you go. There's a document that everybody can download from the internet. It's called High Noon to Midnight. It was written by Stephen Steinleit. It's about immigration policy. And what he postulates is that we cannot allow we cannot allow any more Christians in this country because it's, bad for, because it's bad for Jews. My generation. I know to midnight. My current immigration policy tells America that there's also some well, yes. one guy. So one guy. I'd like to try to uh, get into another subject, but before I do, why don't we try an, a, a, an exercise in, uh, in, in democracy here, okay? okay? Is there a legitimate difference or not? Every panel and then the room, by show of hands or whatever, is there absolutely no distinction? Should there be no distinction anywhere in any country on earth between what is called controlled or you know, regulated based on a number of factors, maybe even negative ones, uh, certainly uh, economic ones, jobs and so forth, and uncontrolled and just open borders immigration. Okay? 
Is, is there any difference? Should there, should we, is it an ancient notion that uh, we should just, everybody should open up? Or, Listen, or is there, is there any legitimate? My position has been clear my entire life. Um, is, 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 if you're asking me, does the government have a legitimate concern in the presence of identifiable, identifiable, real, spot on proof of danger from an individual? Absolutely. Not the question. No, that's not the question. No. Not the question. Let me finish. Excuse me. Excuse me. Let me finish. On the other hand, my position is open borders. And my position has been open borders my entire life. My position is you f unless you present those specific criteria that poses an immediate imminent threat, you're talking about someone who's done a bid for rape. Someone who's done a bid for kidnapping, someone who's done a bid for drug dealing of heroin overseas, open borders. When you fly from the East Coast, you know, I keep hearing this, how small we are. You fly from the East Coast of this country to the West Coast of this country, an hour outside of New York City until an hour you get to California, it's open. Yeah, I support open borders completely, but for those circumstances. Hold, hold on, I, I just wanted to do this as an experiment. Does anyone else care to comment on it? You made your position quite clear. Yes. Anybody else? Is there a distinction between, and by the way, I would, I would recouch the question slightly. Of course, nobody's interested in maniacs coming in. However, rather than does the government, I would say, do the people in a country have the right to expect their government to manage immigration as everything else uh, in, in the interest of the health of the society? Okay. That, that, that's that, a different. Yeah, actually, 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 I don't hold. I don't hold. Uh, I hold an entirely different uh, position. I believe that countries should be able to decide who they want in, who they don't. Different considerations. However, however, there is a humanitarian issue. So, if this country launched a war in Syria together with Britain, these two countries should be the first to take care of immigrants from this, of, of, uh, of, refugees, of refugees, ref, refugees. So I believe, to sum it up, I don't believe in open borders. I believe that countries should be able to sustain what they believe to be their culture. Uh, their What's economy. The, their culture? Yeah, yeah, in Europe we have some yeah. countries. That's Europe! What's our culture? Take a look around this world. I don't know, I don't know. Right. I don't know, I'm trying to come with them. Our culture's are completely I'm different. Our culture's are steady, 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 steady. I agree I'm, I'm, I'm trying to come, to, come, to come with a general principle. If you don't have culture, so... So this is your <laughs> yeah. I actually, Wait a minute. I actually, we I may not that's be culture one of the people. most yeah. vague of all the terms culture? for the United States. Especially, culture. Especially for the United culture. Yeah. Listen, American historians, as long as I know historiography, American historians have dealt, and so have sociologists, but I know historians the best because I'm one. They've dealt with this question. What is, if there is, an American culture? And they haven't been able to come up with an answer of what there's no one kind of American culture. I mean, uh, it, it, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that this is uh, the case. Well, we do. Yeah, have, I'll tell you something. No, no. I'm not sure that this is the case. No, no, no. I'm, no, I'm no, not no, no, sure because I'm a tourist in this country, and when I come here, I tour. I fly every night. I stay in a different, in different. So we need some countries. You all look like an extended car park. You spend a lot of time but, in the deep south. You got yeah, culture there. It's not cracked. Not, 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 you know, not that much. But you have, you have, you have different subcultures in this country. And I believe, I believe that people who believe that they have culture, I don't say maybe they are wrong, have the right to sustain this culture. Well, let me, ask, let, me, let, me, let me ask you a hypothetical question. Yes. As a matter of implementation, yeah. so from where in the U.S. Constitution, in the foundational documents, yeah. in the notions of due process, in the notions of equal protection, where do we as a country committed to the rule of law derive the power so that one president gets to say, I love the fucking Irish? The next president gets to say, I love Kenya because I'm a birther. The next president gets to say, oh, I like Dominicans. And the next president says, screw them all but Jews. 
Where is this power right. that's derived from in this country? This is this is this is a legitimate question. It's a legalistic question. Oh. I'm talking I'm talking here about the yeah, metaphysical the principles. Laws before 1965. Wake up. Can I? African American. One second, please, please. Our host. Let 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 me preface this by saying, those of you who come here Monday night for music know how rare this is for me. I don't even plan my own session because I think that's not a host's role. But I want to tell you for two seconds about my mother and her culture. My mother is Lovari Gypsy. She's whole. No, dude. If in fact. And Gilad will know that I, whatever he says, I never hold it against him personally. We are a culture that would be denied in 41 nations, including this nation, if there were a cultural determinant. We are the most hated people on this planet, bar none. And what did my mother do in this country? She was a chief designer for Calvin Klein shoes, and she helped to facilitate the Abraham Lincoln Brigade in, the, in 1936, and she helped dig this auditorium. I think we benefited by having a policy that did not deny her gypsy family. For Thank you. Of yeah. Did we, did we, uh, I, I, I know two of the panelists responded. I don't know if the other two want to respond or not. But then for the audience, is, is, should we, is, it a, is it a quaint notion, a bad notion, that there is a reason to, for any country to manage its uh, immigration policy? Or is it open border? By show of hands, open, totally open borders. Uh, it's an old idea, uh, or there is legitimate reasons for managing or uh, yeah. considering to manage. Yeah. Yeah. Setting aside, se setting aside, bringing in crazy people, okay, and setting aside not bringing in people that we are responsible for creating uh, the refugee status in the first place. Preferably, don't do the uh, the activity that makes them refugees. Okay. Anyway, I, I think that we are about to to, uh, to to end this session. So what if we can we can end it now? But we could do something else. If you want, if you want, we can take three or four quick, if they are quick, kind of a sentence and a half questions, and then we try to address it each of us and so on and so on. What do you think, Tom? Uh, I, it, Only very quick, 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 quick one round? after the other. Yeah. A lightning round? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Very, very quick. Okay. Yeah. I want to get away from all this politics. That's fine, but just Good. make a quick question. Okay. Um, my question is, what is, what would you consider the Jewish Messiah? What is the Messiah to you? Okay, one question. Next question. <laughs> no, no, no. no, no. We we do it wrong. Wrong. I think There's she's a parking meter in Brazil. Brazil. Yeah. Yeah. I've been to Brazil. Uh, uh, Tom, okay. Tom, you take first. Yeah. Can, uh, Mr. Otsman, can you narrow your focus to the last hundred years and talk from the Balfour Declaration forward? And if what's going on now in Syria is the culmination of the Zionist plan that's been a hundred years in the in the in the going, you know, Syria and you know not the Oded you know, Yemen, the Oded Yemen and going back to 1897. Okay. Nice, nice. Maybe two more questions and. This gentleman with the hat up here, please make a succinct question. Do you know anything about the benefits as opposed to non-benefits of people who have to uh, work in the, with other immigrants and doing uh, low-wage labor? Do you know anything about that? Sorry, I don't hear you well enough. He's saying, does anybody here understand or know about the benefit or non-benefit of low-wage workers in a country having to compete with immigrants for jobs. I don't know if you meant legal immigrants or undocumented. That's immigrants. a good question. Yeah, it is a good question. Well, they had to, have to be, my experience is they were illegal. Yeah, yeah. They didn't come from the south, they came from the north. Okay, last, last well, 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 thing. This, this is something that you can look up, that African Americans have been the most disadvantaged by illegal immigration. You can, you can research, you can find this. People who have lived this for, here for years have no jobs, and that's why there's so many people in prison. Okay, the guy there. Okay, sir, sir. I've been reluctant to ask a question here. Uh, seeing I am not a Jewish person, 
Huh. But I am a human being. We had to do as well. Thank God. Um, what I see here today is something that everybody chowing at each other without listening to it. And my question would be to the staff is why the policy of George Bush, George W. Bush, or your president, <coughs> whoever his name is, affect the problems in the Middle East. Not only the Jewish problem, the Palestinians, and all of them, how I would like to have a comment from the panel here, how would that affect that policy of Donald Trump, George W. Bush, that Oil. we had done? Oil. That's right. Oil. Oil. <laughs> it's all oil. All right. It's oil and big corporations. <laughs> Whatever. It's oil. Okay. Does it's anybody want to take those questions? Can I just answer yours first? Yeah. Um, well, also. Yeah. 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 I. I, I was the first. Oil. I was the first college graduate in my family. Uh, the only college graduate in my family. I grew up in a three and a half room apartment. My father worked as a sales clerk and got fired as a result of some problems he had from World War II. Um, so I very much understand what it is to come from a, a, a working class tradition in history and roots. And what it, what it means in terms, well no, let me finish, and what it means in terms of competition from other folks to marginal employment. It doesn't change my opinion. I'll tell you something about this. Well, we have no, 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 no. We get, we get, we get on the way. You don't want to know, but well, no, 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 it's not the place. If you want to talk about, yeah, it, yeah, we, we, we are finishing, we're finishing the session because we are about to play music, right. which is way more important. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, I'll take your question. Although I'm not, I'm definitely not the uh, Judaic expert in this uh, session. Yeah, yeah, but my, 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 my Michael can definitely uh, answer. To start with, the concept of. Uh, um, Masonism is not, some argue that it's not really a Jewish concept. However, however, I came to the conclusion that Judaism is just one Jewish religion. In fact, everything can become a Jewish religion. Every setting that facilitates a sense of chosenness can become a Jewish religion. So the Holocaust, we are special because we are, we are sufferers. Uh, Bolshevism was a Jewish religion for a while. Uh, Zionism is a Jewish religion, and so on and so on. So, if Jewish religion, if, if when we come to understand Jewish religion, we ask, and what is the Jewish God? The Jewish God is apparently the Jew. Uh, and this is this is this is how I see Messianism, Messianism in in reference, and it's obviously something that uh, Judaic people wouldn't 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 accept. This is I'm why. God. I didn't know. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. No, no, you are not the Jew. You are not a Jew. You, wait. You ask a specific question right. about what is Judaism's view of the Messiah, right? Right. Okay. So so then to answer that question. We need to talk about that from the position of Judaism. Now, there is an Orthodox Jewish position, and there, then we have Reformed Judaism, which has a rather different view since they gave up the Messiah. But as opposed to what Gilad said, this has to be answered from the religious point of view, whether or not one believes it. I mean, uh, 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 this is a, your question was a question that, that asks for, uh, for information and knowledge, not for whether one believes it could be this or it could be that. Now, it's, now it, the, answers, the answers are way too complicated in, in one sense. But I made it simple, actually. <laughs> I made it very simple, even if you don't think that it's true. It no, sorry. Yeah, you made it simple, but you didn't make it simple from a Judaic point of view, and that's what she asked. No, no. No, it's don't. fucking like a true atheist. Yeah. You got the atheist opinion of that, and I think it's pretty clear. My, my, my answer is... She I didn't said, ask for an atheist opinion. No, 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 but, but she I presented... I presented it. I presented it. I said I'm not talking...
talking as a Judaic expert. This, oh. this is my critical. Man. Yeah, this vision is supposed to be a lightning round. All right, yeah. next light. What was the next yeah. lightning question? The gentleman up there. Balfour Declaration. Are right. we in the culmination of it now? 1897 and what's going on in the Middle East, the borders from Tigris to the Euphrates. Inon, Inon plan, you know all yeah, about is it. Is that what's coming? Is that where we're at? Yes. We're yes. getting rid of all these people on yes. the size of refugees, yes. clearing yes. Out the area, and the final borders yes. going to be declared. You know the answer. Yes. Thank There's going to be a new Sandy Hook built there for yes. the Oklahoma bombing case Sandy next. I, I have no idea what that should be. <laughs> anyway, I, I, I think I think that it's a Jewish conspiracy. Uh -huh. Isn't that like the arch Jewish conspiracy? We have a good term. Okay. 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 No, no, you know the plan. plan. It's in the open. You can read it. Well, yeah, it's, not, it's not a conspiracy. It's the Yanon plan. You can look it up on Google. Yeah. Right out. Okay. Uh, is that all the time that we have? Yeah. I, th I, th I think so. I think so. Uh, I wish there was more time. Uh, I wish there were more events. Uh, if you like this, then I would suggest that uh, we will be out and we we we. we you know how to get in contact with many of these people, and and then Larkin Orway, our, our host. Thank you. We should do more of this. Uh, does anybody here feel that uh, the people outside were right that you shouldn't have been allowed to come in here and hear? Them?